name is Haley Halverson, and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit founded in 1962, dedicated to a mission to defend human dignity and to advocate for the universal right of sexual justice, which we define to mean freedom from sexual exploitation, objectification, and violence. To that end, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation operates on the cutting edge of policy activism, influencing policy changes at institutes like institutions such as Google, Hilton Worldwide, the Department of Defense, Walmart, and more. It also works to advance public education and leads the Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation, which boasts nearly 300 organizations and individuals dedicated to addressing various forms of sexual exploitation. At the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we work to address the links between all forms of sexual exploitation, recognizing that issues like sex trafficking, military sexual assault, pornography, prostitution, and more do not occur in a vacuum. We believe that our federal government must address the full spectrum of sexual harm, which is why we developed the Freedom from Sexploitation Agenda to present Congress and the executive branch with robust and critical recommendations that powerfully combat <coughs> sexual exploitation and protect human rights. Today, our distinguished speakers will unpack and analyze several of the complex facets of sexual exploitation in America today, in addition to providing concrete policy solutions that can aid in the defense of human dignity. Our first two speakers will be John Hawkins, Senior Vice President and Executive Director at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Her initiatives at the National Center have led to sweeping policy changes at Google, Verizon, Department of Defense, and more. She has been on media outlets including Fox & Friends, CNN, and Good Morning America. After her, we will hear from Dr. Gail Dines, who is a professor of sociology and women's studies at Wheelock College. She's been doing research and writing about the pornography industry for, set, for over 20 years, and she is, her latest book is Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, and that has been translated into five languages. So with that, thank you very much, and we'll open the stage. Thank you. Let me just make sure that's good enough. Well, good afternoon. I want to start by just explaining that at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we believe that forms of sexual exploitation and abuse are interconnected, and that to deal successfully with one form of sexual exploitation, we must recognize and understand the links between them all. And so today, I would like to illustrate examples of how forms of sexual exploitation overlap. Last week, an attorney representing an eight-year-old little girl raped multiple times by a 13-year-old neighbor boy contacted our office. The young boy, who appears to be addicted to hardcore pornography, actually had his younger siblings and the four-year-old sibling of the girl watch the sexual assault as if it was a play. What should we expect when a 13-year-old with an immature brain has been exposed and conditioned to the extremes of internet pornography? Unfortunately, it seems to me that he learned his pornography lessons well and as a result, it will take years, maybe decades, for, the, <laughs> for these children to unravel the trauma that they've endured. Sadly, this is not an isolated incident. While there is not yet much data on this growing problem, reports of sexual abuse among younger and younger children are on the rise. I receive Google alerts almost daily with news reports on child-on-child -on -child sexual abuse. Last year, Reports out of England, where they are keeping track, explain that allegations of children committing <coughs> sexual offenses against other children have risen 78% in four years. Also last year, um, a new law was passed in the state of Missouri, and they found that, excuse me, this law required that complaints of children with problem sexual be behaviors be assessed by the state. And before this, there was no procedure in that state, and most states have no procedure for this. <coughs> While experts have believed that the number of cases this would affect each year would be around 600, and just five, min five months after that was passed, there were 2,000 cases. 
Child sexual abuse often leads to anxiety, depression, self-harm, PTSD, risky sexual behaviors, poor physical health, drug and alcohol <coughs> dependencies later in life, and a list of other difficult struggles. We know that child sexual abuse often creates an individual's entry into prostitution. I believe that this problem of child-on-child -child sexual abuse is a, is, is a pandemic. And tens of thousands of families are hurting, and yet we're only just barely starting to discuss this. We must quickly prepare for this, and we must do all we can to curb it. We must especially assess the role that early exposure to hardcore pornography is playing on turning our, in turning our young children into sexual abuse offenders. Here's another story. I recently met a young girl who shared with me that after her um, her older supposed boyfriend insisted that she send him sex messages as he requested. He then threatened to share those new messages with her parents, her teachers, and her friends. He then went on to traffic her, to sell her again and again to his friends and to strangers. It took her three months before she had the courage to tell somebody about it. Using sexting and so-called Revenge pornography as a form of sexual extortion is an increasingly common tactic used by traffickers. Yet young people are hardly hearing any kind of warnings against sexting. <clears throat> so one study I read in the Journal of Adolescence indicated that offline sexual coercion was significantly associated with sending and being asked for a naked image, as well as receiving a naked image without giving permission. This suggests that sexting is an online extension of offline forms of sexual coercion. Last year, the LA County Sheriff Department's um, tra Human Trafficking Bureau provided reporters with a comprehensive update on the horrific nature and the sheer number of human trafficking cases that they have been involved with that included young teens taking nude photos of themselves and sending them over the internet. They, in they investigated 519 cases and one in four of those cases appeared to be selfies taken by the children. I'm reading right now this book called Paid For by Journey Through Prostitution by Rachel Moran. She shares her experiences in prostitution beginning at age 14. And many of those experiences would be classified as instances of sex trafficking. There's one line in particular that I really can't get out of my head. She wrote, I told all of the men I met my age at that time, I did this for a reason, because it had the almost universal effect of causing them to be very aroused and to climax easily, which was good news for me because it meant that the experience was over with quickly. The buyers don't care about these women, their age or how they got there, but we must care about them. There is a major, <laughs> there is a major disconnect between combating sex trafficking and disregarding the inextricable connections to prostitution. Quoting from a speech by Dorkin Michael from Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, prostitution and sex trafficking are the same human rights catastrophe. Both are part of a system of gender-based domination that makes violence against women and girls profitable to a mind-boggling extreme. Both prey on women and girls made vulnerable by poverty, discrimination, and violence and leaves them traumatized sick and impoverished. The concerted effort by some NGOs and governments to disconnect trafficking from prostitution, to treat them as distinct and unrelated phenomena, is nothing less than a deliberate political strategy aimed at legitimizing the sex industry and protecting its growth and profitability. Whether it's deliberate or not, one leads to the other, and we cannot continue to separate these issues. Not long ago, I read a news article reporting a trafficking bust at a strip club where a strip club owner, excuse me, my cough, <laughs> the strip club owner pressured a 14-year-old girl to dance and perform sex acts for money, which the owner then, of course, kept. There were constant news reports of prostitution happening in the back rooms of strip clubs or being arranged between dancers and patrons by club managers. Among those of us who work to combat sex trafficking, strip clubs are known hubs for prostitution and trafficking. Vanita Carter of Breaking Free, who works 
with hundreds of survivors each year, has explained many times over that stripping is a gateway into prostitution. It's the place where the training begins. Until we as a society recognize all forms of sexual exploitation, including stripping, we will never end the vicious cycle of sex trafficking and prostitution. 55% of sex buyers in a study by Dr. Melissa Farley noted that they located women in strip clubs. And 90% of the men she interviewed held the opinion that almost all strip Almost all strip clubs and bars in the Boston area sold minor children in the sex industry. The men buying sex know exactly where to go to find girls for sale. Thus, I was shocked when I learned that one community in Florida recently gave an award to strip club owners. Purportedly, strip club owners operators are now partners in the fight against sex trafficking because they claim to watch out for it and they're donating large sums of money to local anti-trafficking awareness campaigns. This is happening in Houston, in Seattle, in California, in Chicago, across the United States. This represents a bizarre failure on the part of government officials to recognize that the strip club industry's business model is firmly founded on sexual justification of dancers, be they male or female. Why are we giving awards to the very people who are responsible for selling women? Our, our organization works to highlight specifically the public health impacts and harms of pornography. In that role, I've had the opportunity to speak with dozens of female porn performers. And I can tell you that nearly all of them shared with me stories of deception, threat, and violence used to coerce them into pornography or into staying in pornography or into sex acts outside of the porn field. Traffickers and pimps are using pornography to, to advertise prostitution and to traffic women. And survivors of prostitution and trafficking regularly share that in the course of being prostituted, the four sex acts were frequently recorded, distributed, and uploaded to the internet. Further, females who consume pornography are at greater risk of being a victim of sexual harassment and sexual assault. As my theme suggests, these, these links are very clear. The casual way we treat pornography, stripping, and prostitution has greatly increased the problem of sex trafficking. We cannot begin to solve the problem of sex trafficking and yet ignore raw commercial sexual exploitation. Let me elaborate a little bit more on pornography. Common themes in pornography today include teens, children, incest, rape, slavery, racism, and extreme violence, almost always against the female performers. Many young people are exposed to this kind of material before puberty, and many are consuming it regularly. Yet, it, we attempt to solve child exploitation and sexual violence without connecting this dot. While most people today who consume pornography do so via their phone or their computers, mainstream companies like Verizon and Comcast and Amazon and Wyndham Hotels are hardcore pornography distributors. Last week, we, received, we reviewed the titles and descriptions of the films offered through subscription on Comcast, which reaches into more than 22 million homes. We found themes suggestive of incest, teens, racism, and sexual violence. One of the many incest-themed movies was called Step Family, Sex Therapy. The description is on the slide. How many Individuals are sexually abused by step family and family members, and they suffer lifelong anguish. This is the worst hell for many, and yet pornographers in Comcast are putting it out there like it's all fun and games and completely normal. Other titles of mainstream pornography sold by Comcast include these listed above. Even just the language used to describe these films indicate simulated rape with young girls. Of course, America is struggling with the sexual violence problem. And with the young teen themes, it's no wonder that adults are developing a taste for sex with younger and younger children. Comcast even defended, Comcast defended these films to us in a letter recently arguing essentially that they're a benefit to their consumers. 
It doesn't have to be this way, especially as our federal, <clears throat> constitutionally upheld obscenity laws prohibit these companies from selling this material. Our Department of Justice has refused to enforce these laws, and as a result, millions of children and families are experiencing immeasurable harm. Our military has a welcome sign up for women, but our military men are constructing a sexually exploitive culture for them. We have a major cyber-based sexual abuse scandal in our Marine Corps that just exploded these past two weeks. The number of reports of sexual assault in our military continue to indicate a serial problem in their ranks. And while Congress has held multiple hearings on this issue, and many groups have been mobilized to combat the problem, there are two things that we think are defeating their effectiveness in addressing sexual assault in the U.S. military. First, we are not addressing the rapid consumption of pornography that promotes sexual scripts, conditioning men to objectify, use, and abuse women. The Navy even still sells hardcore pornography in all of their base exchanges, and many, and many military bases, especially overseas, provide unhindered free internet access to, to violent pornography. Second, many U.S. military bases are riddled with strip clubs around their borders, and we currently allow our military members to frequent those strip clubs. These are not isolated incidents. When our former United States President and the U.S. Congress rightly appointed commissions and held hearings to address sexual violence on college campuses, the solutions focused largely on teaching consent, a good thing. But they completely ignored the fact that many of those 18 to 21 year olds have been accessing pornography with its raw, bit brutal, debasing, violent, and hate-filled themes since before puberty. Dr. Marianne Layden conducted a survey, which will soon be published, at a prominent New England private university where one in four, that's 25% of the college boys, said that they have already planned or they plan to visit a prostituted woman. How did we get to this point? Again, these are not isolated problems. I just want to keep going because the terror and the trauma of sexual exploitation experienced by so many Americans is great. But in closing, my plea to you today is that we stop addressing these issues as if they are separate problems. America is suffering from systemic sexual exploitation. Evidence supports the fact that child sexual abuse, prostitution, pornography, sex trafficking, sexual violence, these are not isolated phenomena occurring in a vacuum. Rather, these and other forms of sexual exploitation overlap and they often reinforce one another. We call on our federal government to stop approaching these issues as separate problems. Look for solutions that encompass and address seamless connections between all forms of exploitation. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation has developed the Freedom from Sexploitation Agenda to present Congress with, and the executive branch with robust, critical recommendations that powerfully combat exploitation, protect human rights, and preserve human dignity. We seek to be of assistance to you in your efforts to address the full spectrum of harm. Thank you. Today 
is whether a girl ever ends up on a porn set or not, she's being socialized by this culture to be porn ready. And we're taking you through the visual world of our young people. Most of us in this room grew up in a world that was print based. We are now in an image based culture. In an image world, we, in a print based world, we learned how to develop some immunizations, the seduction of eloquence of the printed word. We have no such immunizations, seduction of eloquence of the image. Let's look at this image and let's wander through the world of media and what you are seeing over and over again are white, young, thin, toned, hypersexualized females. For all the images that exist in this image-based world, this is what dominates over and over again. Now we do let some women of color into this world, people like Beyonce or Rihanna, but it's basically a white world with a very white racist beauty standard. And when you look at this image, what you find is that women are given, women and girls are given two choices. Either you conform to the hypersexualization, or you're invisible. And you cannot ask a teenage girl, or teenage boy for that matter, to choose invisibility. Built into the DNA of adolescence is the need to be visible. If all of your friends are walking around with the hypersexualized look of the low slung jeans, the tramp stamp, the pierced belly button, the low top, what do you want of these young girls? And in fact, what we know is that we often blame them, as in Miley Cyrus. We blame her for this rather than her handlers, her parents, and all of those who are in the feeding chain of this young woman and have been in that feeding chain since she was seven years old. But what do we do? We go to the actual victim of all of this rather than the victimizers. Now, when I was writing my book, I was thinking, what's really going on here? What has happened in our culture? And who really gave me insight was not actually somebody with a PhD in sociology, but an incarcerated rapist who told me that when he was raping his 10-year-old stepdaughter, he didn't really need to do the grooming, i.e. get her ready for the rape, because the culture is a lot of the grooming for him. We are now in a position where the culture is perpetrating against our young girls. They're grooming them into a hypersexualized, roboticized, industrialized type of sexuality that is produced by the porn industry and the hypersexualized pop culture industry. There is nothing authentic in this, and young girls have lost the capacity to develop their own authentic sexuality that they should be allowed to be the authors of, not some multi-billion dollar a year industry. Now we also have a second perp culture, and that is the porn industry. Now I come at this from a feminist perspective. What I want to say is very clear that feminists are men's best friends. We are men's best friends because we refuse to accept that what the pornographers say about men is true. We know that men have the capacity for intimacy, for connection, for all the things that women have the capacity for. And I know that because I'm a sociologist, I know that because I am a feminist, and I know that most profoundly because I am the mother of a son, and I will not let the pornographers speak for my son on their behalf. Because if my son is worth more, you know what? Your sons are worth more also. So what the pornographers say is that your sons are nothing more than life support systems for erect penises. <laughs> Do you think that's true? Of course not. So let's talk about what Details Magazine again says about pornography. There's an entire generation of young people who think sex ends with a money shot to the face. You all know what a money shot is? That is where they calculate on the face. That is true. I hear this from my students all the time that their boyfriends or hookups want to ejaculate on the face. Let me ask the women in this room over the age of 35, did any man ever ask you for that when you were growing up? No. Okay? Do you think men have suddenly caught a virus that says they want to ejaculate onto the face? Or do you think they're being socialized by the porn culture? Now what we know is that the internet changed the way that men and boys interface with pornography. It made pornography affordable, it made it anonymous, and it made it accessible. The three A's that drive the man. Now let's talk about what we know. This is from a pornographer. A lot of people get distracted from the business model by the sex if the porn industry is just as multi-layered and sophisticated as any other marketplace. We are talking about a multi-billion dollar industry here. We know that the average age of first viewing pornography is 11, and pornography controls about a third of the internet, be it in downloads, be it in traffic, be it in bandwidth. 
Now, of course, I get more visitors each month from Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. If this doesn't make your blood run cold in your veins, I don't know what does. Now, how do boys get into pornography? They get in through the free porn sites. Now, while there might seem to be millions and millions of pornography sites and millions and millions of images, it might surprise you to know that one company, MindGeek, owns about 80 to 90 percent of all porn that is distributed in the world. They are based in Luxembourg with offices all over the world, and this is the one company, this is the Walmart, they own all the free porn sites, they're the most trafficked, and they invented the concept of free porn. Now, when we talk about free porn, it's very, very important. Because when we look at what's in free porn, we know from studies that nearly 90% of images are violence against women. The most violent are gagging, where women are gagged with a penis until so she's basically choking, rough anal sex, ejaculation on the face, ATM, that's ass to mouth, where the penis is put into the anus of the woman and then straight into her mouth without washing, hair pulling, spitting in her face. Let me give you an example of what they say on the porn sites. Do you know we say to things like romance and foreplay? We say fuck up. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would like to do. We make them gag till their makeup starts running, etc. Do you understand how they're bringing boys in here? We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. No. When they're 11, they don't want to do this. But they're being told, you want a man? You want to be masculine? This is your initiation process into masculinity which means we are traumatizing a generation of boys. Because when they put porn into Google, they anticipate seeing maybe breasts, maybe a vagina, maybe sex. They do not anticipate the violence. We have 40 years of peer-reviewed research. There is no question that the effects of pornography are multiple, being on the emotional, psychological, and cognitive impact of development. Now, what do we know about the future? The future is that it's going to get worse and more harmful. We either act now or we basically hold up our hands and deliver our children to the pornographers. So in my group, culturally friend, I have a few visual here, we are a health-based group that believes in the Gulliver strategy. You tie this monster down piece by piece. Our decision of culturally friend is to go the public health group. We basically believe that public health takes all of these silos that people work in, therapists, doctors, teachers, youth workers, and it destroys the silos. It puts everybody together who need to be together. Educators, mental health professionals, parent groups, youth and family advocates and activists. The public health model is multidisciplinary, it's multisectorial, it's collaborative, it's multicultural. Why do we call pornography a public health issue? Because of the domino effect. That one boy masturbating in that room has a collective effect on the family, on the culture, on the society, and the nature of the world we live in. We are building two programs, one for parents, two for healthcare. For our parents, the most important thing we do, need to do is to give them tools on how to talk to their children about pornography. We will have online components of breast practice conversations, we'll have downloads on there for people to download scripts, to have interviews, we will have videos with specialists. We will be basically educating the parents to educate the kids so they can build resilience and resistance in our children to the porn culture. We're also going to have resources for kids who are already in trouble. We will have a map on the um, website where you can put in where you live and if you need help, we will have names of therapists who have been trained in this so that you can go to a trained therapist. It's going to be a holistic sex education program that builds resilience and resistance in children. Secondly is our health professionals program. I recently spoke and gave a keynote at the American Academy of Pediatrics, 3,000 pediatricians. This is the first time they had somebody speak about the impact of pornography on adolescents. Believe me, if they ask me to keynote, they're desperate because they're going to have to deal with this and they understand that. Our consultancy team of culturally framed is made up of PhDs, site Ds, and MDs. We have brought together a stellar team our director of programs is Liz Walker, who is actually in Australia. We found the one person who is a parent educator who knows how to speak to parents, children, and build curriculum. Ultimately, when you educate parents and you educate health professionals, you mobilize resilience and resistance in the society for social change. If you want to see more of this, you can go on my TEDx talk, just put in Gail Dines TEDx, Growing Up in a Porn Culture. That's Gail Dines TEDx, Growing Up in a Porn Culture. 
please go on our website, culturereframe.org, sign up for our newsletter. And let me say one thing, we have a choice here. We can either stand up and be bold and decide we're no longer going to hand our children over to the pornographers, or we can stand back and let this culture collapse under the weight of itself. And when I say that, I'm not exaggerating. Because when these boys who have been brought up on pornography grow up to be men, what kind of fathers are they going to be? What kind of partners are they going to be? What kind of lawyers, judges, teachers? You know what? We have to do this, and we have to do this because our children deserve this from us. It is our job as adults. It is our job as academics. It is our job as scholars. It is our job as public citizens. Thank you.
There were several occasions where my friends and I would actually watch porn together in class at a public high school. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is just to paint you a picture of how prevalent porn use was amongst my friends and I. It was a normal part of our teen culture. In retrospect, it is clear that it was affecting our behavior, how we viewed and treated our peers, and ultimately our sexuality. I became sexually active at the age of 14, and that was when the battle between pixels on a screen and my sex drive for real life partners began. Through high school and into college, uh, the impact porn was having on me worsened, ultimately leading to a time when I was 23, I went to have sex with a girl I found extremely attractive uh, and beautiful, but when we went to have sex, I couldn't. I couldn't feel any arousal, excitement, emotion. Um, so I was a young, otherwise healthy guy. I had no clue what could possibly be wrong with me. So I did what anyone would do. I got on Google. I typed in young guy erection problem. And my search for answers led me to something that blew my mind. I found forums with thousands of guys all saying the same thing. And they were my age, and they were younger, they were teenagers saying that they've used internet porn for several years and they reached a place where they could no longer function with their real life partners. Long story short, I decided to quit. And quitting wasn't easy, but one thing that helped me was getting educated on the neuroscience behind addiction, the neuroscience behind sexual conditioning, and how porn can alter our sexual template in our brain. There are now forums with hundreds of thousands of guys all over the internet where they're giving up porn for mental and physical health reasons. So for these guys, it's not a moral issue, it's a mental and physical health um, issue. I saw a big need to point these guys to health information, so I started Reboot Nation. It's an online recovery community, and it has grown to 10,000 members in just three years, mostly young guys. There's now a lot of research coming out in the last couple of years that documents this sharp rise in youthful sexual dysfunction. This 2016 paper that featured several U.S. Navy psychiatrists and urologists pointed out that all studies assessing youthful sexual dysfunction, age 18 to 40 young men, reported ED rates of 2 to 5 percent before 2002. It also said that multiple studies since 2010 have the same age group of guys reporting ED rates of close to 30 percent. So to take the, uh, this, oh yeah, I should also say this, this paper also had case studies that um, had sailors recover from sexual dysfunction by removing porn use. That's important to point out. So to answer the question of what, the, what impact is porn having on young men, what are the effects, let's take a look at some of the most common effects young guys report. Um, we have anorgasmia and delayed ejaculation, which sometimes that can be a precursor to ED. This is where it becomes increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to climax with a real partner. A lot of guys say they have to fantasize about pornography or maybe masturbate while they're with the partner just to, uh, to be able to climax. We have erectile dysfunction. Your erection still works with porn. You're dependent on porn, but you can't get it up with a real partner, so there's porn dependence. And that also points out that it's not an other organic problem. We have brain fog concentration problems. Um, the sexual dysfunctions are usually the only things that uh, get a young guy's attention, but there's other effects. This is a real common um, side effect that we see. We have increased social anxiety, it becomes increasingly uncomfortable in social situations. Declining interest in real relationships. Uh, this happens more subconsciously where sexual triggers now make you crave pixels on screen, your laptop, your phone, and not intimacy with the real partner. And we have morphing porn taste uh, escalation. What, what used to arouse you no longer does the trick, so you escalate into more extreme, shocking material, uh, or click to something new for the novelty to achieve arousal. In 2012, approximately 1,500 guys on a porn recovery site were asked if their taste in pornography had changed with uh, continued use. 56% of them said their taste in pornography became more extreme or deviant. 24% of these guys uh, had shame around this escalation, but 32% of them not, uh, did not have shame. So it's important to see that a majority of the guys that escalated into more extreme abusive content didn't even have any shame around it. That's important to point out because a lot of skeptics of this being a real issue will say that only people with shame around their porn use will develop problems. Uh, 
that's not true. Psychiatrist Norman Deutsch uh, helps us understand how escalation can happen or morphing sexual taste. He says the content of what patients found exciting changed as websites introduced themes and scripts that altered the brains without their awareness. Because plasticity is competitive, the brain maps for new, exciting images increased at the expense of what had previously attracted them. This 2014 study on an adolescent 16 to 18 year old heterosexuals asked about the motivations for anal sex. The results found that anal heterosex often appeared to be painful, risky, and coercive, particularly for women, and the interviewees frequently cited pornography as the explanation for anal sex. Now I want to look at a few important quotes that I think are telling. One of the young girls interviewed simply said this, obviously people enjoy it if they do it, but we know from this same study's results that one of the main reasons of doing it is because they've seen actors pretending to enjoy it, not because they innately enjoy it. Another very telling quote from a young teenage guy that was interviewed, there's several things in here. He said, I think that the boy enjoyed it. I think it's the boy that pushes for it from watching porn and stuff. They want to try it. The girl is scared and thinks it's weird, and then they try it because the boyfriend wants them to. They normally don't enjoy it because they're scared, and I, I know that life is angle if you're not willing to don't relax. So what is happening? Young people are manipulating and coercing their partners into doing things they're scared to do or don't enjoy doing because they've been conditioned by porn to get scared and have pleasure. So what we have is a public health crisis. The widespread use of porn is affecting people in negative ways emotionally, mentally, and physically. And it's not just affecting the user. It's affecting the entire relationship dynamic and what young couples think is normal. This is an actual screenshot I took a couple months ago on a recovery site. I did a search for suicide, and I got back 26 pages of results of young guys contemplating killing themselves because they've been screwed by pornography and they're not sure if they're ever going to recover. I've had a 12-year-old reach out to me because he wants to stop watching bestiality porn and he has no idea how to stop. I've had a grown man in his 50s come up to me after a talk at a conference, sobbing with tears down his face because he's been addicted to porn for over 20 years. And I've had parents call me with desperation in their voices because they found their eight-year-olds watching hardcore abusive pornography, and they don't know how to filter it on their devices. This is a serious issue. But I want to end on a good note. There is hope. Um, we have thousands of success stories piling up daily, mine being one of them where people are not just regaining their sexual function, but they're also regaining their motivation and their zest for life. Um, when I first quit porn, I just wanted to get my sexual function back. But after recovering and getting educated on how porn impacted me, I now have more compassion, more empathy, and more motivation. And I see women as humans to be respected and loved and not objects as menstrual aids. So what can we do? Uh, I think the first step is to raise awareness. I think that the, we need to get the information out to the public so everyone can make informed decisions regarding porn use. That's a good first step. I think the best way to do that is uh, by education about how porn can impact the brain. Um, I believe sex education should include a basic understanding of the brain's reward circuit and the effects of overstimulation. I stayed away from hard drugs when I was a kid because I knew of the potential negative effects, but I had no clue that porn could have a negative physiological impact on me. Lastly, we have to do a better job of protecting uh, children from being exposed to porn and having such easy access to it. I think that mandatory filtering softwares on all minors, internet accessible devices would be a good step toward achieving that. This is a pivotal moment in human history where technologies drastically change the environment our kids are growing up in. It doesn't matter what political party you are or whether you're religious or you're not, I'm pleading with you today to come together in a bipartisan effort to ensure the future health and well-being of our nation's youth. Thank you. prostitution and sex trafficking. Survivors of prostitution and sex trafficking are human beings. You may be asking yourself, 
Who are the two questions? The first is, what is the role of demand in prostitution? The second, what is the role of demand in sex trafficking? The fact that both questions have the same answer should tell us that there's a direct correlation between prostitution and sex trafficking. Many may debate that those who engage in prostitution do so out of choice, while those who are trafficked engage in force, fraud, or coercion. While we're not here to debate today, we can all agree that on both sides, it is a matter of survival, it is the exploitation of human beings, and demand is, driving the fact, is the driving factor that promotes the existence of prostitution and sex trafficking. The scourge of prostitution and sex trafficking continues to exist in our communities for a number of reasons. To begin with, there is a disregard for the value of human life. As I travel across the world making presentations, I love to ask the audience, what is one thing you value? The response oftentimes are my family, my job, my faith. Rarely do people say life. Traffickers thus capitalize on society's collective disregard for human life, seizing the opportunity to see people as commodities. The demand for prostitution and sex trafficking can be conceptualized in the economical theory of supply and demand where human beings are at the center. We cannot continue to try to address the issue of demand by separating the core components into categories of adults and children, male and female, survivors of prostitution or survivors of trafficking. We must realize that the common denominator in all categories are human beings. Human beings whose lives are impacted by physical and psychological abuse. Human beings who are in need of help. Survivors of prostitution and sex trafficking are human beings. There are 10 ways that we can effectively address the role of demand in prostitution and sex trafficking. These 10 ways are in no particular order of importance. Number one, we must begin to change the mindset of our culture and understand the realities of those who engage in prostitution and are trafficked. Intersectionality is at the core. The lack of economic opportunity, lack of education, poverty, race, Class and gender inequality are amongst the reasons why people engage in prostitution and are trafficked. These issues must be addressed if we are to successfully combat demand. Number two, we must change the mindset of our culture where we're more sympathetic to those who engage in, in the purchase of commercial sex. I'm sorry, we must be more sympathetic to those who are engaged in commercial sex and less sympathetic to the men who purchase sex. The men who purchase sex continues to get a slap on the wrist <laughs> as their lives are considered to be more valuable. <clears throat> There's no direct impact on their life once they purchase sex. After all, he's the CEO, he's a senator, a family man, he has children. If anyone should find out that he engaged in commercial sex, it will impact his career or his family. While the prostituted or trafficked individual is seen as someone who's neurotic and not deserving of assistance. Number three, we must understand that language matter. The men who purchase sex must be given should not be given names like Byers and John that hide their misogynistic acts. Those names normalize their behavior. We must begin to, to call them by their true names, rapists, pedophiles, child molesters, abusers, and such. Sending the message that their behavior is not normal nor acceptable. Number four, enforce existing laws. Many are pushing for stronger laws, but the rule of law is simply not enough. There are laws already on the books that need to be enforced so that the men who purchase sex are deterred. Laws should be enforced without fear of losing the case. And for this reason, I will always honor and respect 
Cynthia Cortez, the first federal prosecutor in the United States to use the Trafficking Victims Protection Act to prosecute the purchase the purchasers of sex trafficking victims in 2009. Of the seven buyers she prosecuted, in one instance, six of them were sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. She was not afraid to use the law. She was not afraid to lose. In fact, she would challenge the detectives to dig deeper into their cases so that victory was eminent for the prosecution. Number five, Follow the recommendations of reports and studies conducted to address demand. In a 2008 Chicago study, Deconstruction the Demand for Prostitution, 113 men who purchased sex were interviewed. When asked what would deter them to purchase sex, 87% stated their name being listed in the local paper. 82% stated their photo and name on the internet. 79% stated a letter sent to their family that they were arrested for soliciting or engaging in prostitution. 70% said a car impounded, and 68% stated a fine larger than $1,000. There are lessons to be learned from each report and study conducted. Number six, there should be a significant shift in the criminal justice response. Oftentimes, the word victim-centered approach is used. While I applaud the use of this term, a victim-centered approach does not criminalize the victim, but understand that a prostituted or trafficking individual is in need of services. Prostituted and trafficking individuals should not be arrested and charged as criminals. As criminal convictions are a barrier to restoration. For example, with a criminal conviction, trafficked, trafficked individuals and prosecuted individuals um, don't get access to jobs, education, or housing. Instead, the focus should be placed on arresting and charging buyers and traffickers. Arresting the prosecuted individuals further reinforces their exploitation while the men who purchase sex get away and perpetuate the cycle of abuse. While I was being trafficked, I was arrested five times on a state level. Not once did I ever witness the buyer being arrested, he had alone charged. However, on each occasion I was arrested and charges were brought against me. I can remember the arresting officer telling the driver of one car, get out of here, as he proceeded to handcuff me. I remember my first arrest. A strip club I was escorted at was raided, and all the patrons were asked to leave, while the girls were lined up, questioned, and arrested. Not one buyer was arrested. In fact, the undercover operation was set up for the women who propositioned patrons for sex, and not for the men who solicited sex. Number seven. We need to learn from existing models that are effective in other countries. We need to take a closer look at the Nordic model, which criminalizes the act of buying sex and decriminalizes the act of selling sex. A 2015 report, Trafficking of Human Beings, stated that the Nordic model has been effective in combating trafficking and prostitution. According to the European Union's Harmonized Data on Trafficking, Sweden and Norway, for instance, have much more lower trafficking prostitution rates than the Netherlands. The United States can learn from this. Number eight, the psychological trauma endured by prostituted individuals and trafficking survivors have lasting impacts. The psychological trauma does not disappear when, once one exists, exits the life. It lingers and may take years to address even with trauma-informed counseling and mental health treatment. Like many survivors of trafficking, I too had a quota, quota imposed on me by my trafficker, and there were severe consequences if my quota was not met. The consequences result in both physical and psychological abuse. Both were hurtful, and oft, as oftentimes he would kick me with his timber boots, choke me to the point of unconsciousness, and dehumanized me through his verbal abuse, which had lasting psychological impacts. 
Now, while the physical pain went away in days, it took years to address the psychological abuse that led me to impact the trauma of not feeling worthy, accepted, or even a human being. While being trafficked, my trafficker never allowed us to have color in our hair or wore our hair color. He stated that those things are not attractive to buyers. After exiting the life, it took me years to wear my hair curly. As I continued to believe the lie that I had to wear my hair straight to be attractive. Recently, I colored my hair for the first time in my life. What do you think? <laughs> but at first, when I colored my hair, each time I looked in the mirror, I was reminded by the words of my trafficker. Some would say, Dye your hair black so you won't be you won't be reminded. But I will not. I will not allow his words to hold me in bondage 12 years later. I will continue to color my hair as I embrace my truth that I am still beautiful and attractive, attractive with my hair colored, as you all agree. <coughs> Number nine, a comprehensive model must be implemented. The issue of the man cannot be fought single-handedly. Parents and schools should teach about harms of prostitution and sex trafficking. In addition, employers should implement and enforce strict policies against those who engage in commercial sex, and federal and state policies must be enforced. Number 10, make a conscious effort in all your work to recognize that survivors of human trafficking and, prostit and prostituted individuals are human beings. We're not just research products, a source of income, or a way to make you feel better about yourself. Just like you and everyone else, our well-being and health and existence are valuable and matters. Despite our past, we too deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. I am Shamir McKenzie, and I am a human being. Thank you. Why does sexual exploitation matter? It matters because childhood sexual abuse has been called the royal road to adult psychopathology. More adults with psychological problems have childhood sexual abuse in their histories than any other factor. It matters because sexual assault is more likely to produce post-traumatic stress than any other event, including war trauma. It matters because opponent process tells us that with any phenomena, the degree of good that that phenomenon produces is often offset by the degree of bad. Sex has power for good. It's connected to the production of human life, with love, intimacy, pleasure, and helping to maintain the bonds of, between people. On the other side, sex is connected to some of the worst events that we can name. Child rape, child sex trafficking, selling of sex as a product. If you can sell it, you can steal it. And the selling of it is the sexual exploitation industry. The stealing is sexual violence and abuse. The sexual exploitation industry and, the sexual, and sexual abuse are a seamless, interconnected continuum. We can't break them apart. The sexual exploitation industry teaches lessons that produce permission-giving beliefs that are then played out and acted out in sexual callousness, abuse, and violence. These permission-giving beliefs are, uh, uh, are produced in sexual exploitation and have effect on all of these different factors, males and females, though females are six times as likely to be affected by sexual exploitation, <coughs> professionals and students, married and single, users and partners of users, victims, perpetrators, and victim perpetrators. These are the stories of those damaged lives. Emily was raped as a child by her father and her father's best friend, 
who were pornography users. She was raped as an adult by a stranger and by her husband. She would diso dissociate on her job when her boss would act in ways that were verbally abusive, orally demanding, overly demanding, and when she had the thought that she was helpless and that no man could be trusted. She thought she was defective, she thought she was unlovable, and she was depressed and very actively suicidal. She couldn't interact with any males, including her own adult son. But therapy healed. She began to believe that she was not defective, nor was she powerless. Her boss was fired. She divorced her husband, moved to another location for a job she liked better, became closer to her son, and had male friends that she enjoyed. Sally was kidnapped and gang raped and sex trafficked at the age of 12. As an adult, she would go in and out of the life, even as she continued to pursue her education. She couldn't tolerate being in class when the word police came out because the police were implicated in her sex trafficking. Many of her behavioral skills were skills based on scamming the system, and she was missing many helpful life skills. She had her beliefs of mistrust, that no, everyone wanted to hurt her. She believed she was defective and that she was totally broken. She had an abandonment belief that, no one, that everyone would always be her. At times, she tried to stand in therapy, and that made therapy difficult and very slow given those experiences she had in her childhood. Stephen was raped by a priest for most of his childhood, and he thought that the priest was next to God. The priest showed him porn. Stephen thought that he might be gay. The priest normalized the sex and became enmeshed in Stephen's life. The priest officiated at Stephen's wedding and was present in the delivery room at Stephen's first child's birth. Stephen acted out sexually with women. Stephen never re revealed the information of the abuse to his wife until after they were married for many years. She was understanding and supportive, and yet he felt shame and was depressed. He pursued his abuser both legally and through religious accountability, and the priest was defrauded. Gloria's father was distant and cold to her as a child and uninvolved with her life. When she decided to become a stripper, no one counseled her to reconsider. The job included verbal abuse from customers and staff, physical damage, she was once kicked in the head. She hated the men who were customers who would, some, would sometimes get involved with them. All relationships with customers were toxic and sexually abusive. She was an alcoholic, and when she told her boss she wanted to stop drinking, he told her that she was required to drink alcohol on her job. She believed all these things were normal and typical. Therapy continued on and off for years. She left the strip club and went into a field that she enjoyed to self-esteem and Beth was raped on campus at a party jointly hosted by her sorority and a fraternity. She told the school, and they did nothing. She told her sorority sisters, and they blamed her. She told her parents, and all they did was make her live off campus. She confronted the rapist, and he was unrepentant and said, that's what happens at fraternity parties. He laughed and said he did it because he could. This is a chilling statement because it is a prototypic psychopath statement. I do it because I can. She was depressed. Therapy healed. She came back to campus, finished her degree, increased her self-esteem, reduced her self-blame. Nothing happened to the rapist. Oops. Oh, this one wants to yep. Trish was a graduate student. In class, her male professor showed the class pornography. He then began to sexually pursue her, even though he would not only have to give her a grade in that class, but he was also her advisor and would have to guide and evaluate her throughout her graduate education. They moved in together and kept a secret. The relationship was abusive, and she decided to leave. He threatened to ruin her career, gave, give her a bad letter of reference, block her from getting another advisor, ruin her dissertation, and make sure she never got a job. She left anyway. He caused a lot of problems, but she read with them, and she came to believe that all of this was not her fault. Frank used child pornography. He told himself it didn't hurt the child, if it didn't hurt the child and anyone else as long as he didn't touch the child. He told himself he could not get arrested or spend time in prison as long as he was not using his work computer. Despite the fact that Frank had in the past been arrested for accessing material on his home computer. He continued to use that material and stayed in denial. He was arrested and lost his job. Dan said he started using internet pornography just because he was curious to see why so many people, he thought all people, were using it. He used it on his job because his computer at work was so much better than his home computer. He said he never thought about the rules of his job, nor the dangers. He 
He was a doctor who was the head of the medical service, and he had residents coming in and out of his office all day. IT found out about his use, he lost his job, he almost lost his license and his career. <coughs> Susan looked at pornography because she wanted to learn about sex, and her boyfriend wanted her to look at it with him and be sexually aroused by it. Her boyfriend wanted her to be willing to do things that she saw because he liked them. He continued sexual interactions with her even when she was crying during those interactions. She thought, my body does not work right if she didn't like anal sex and did not have an orgasm when she performed oral sex on men. Um, her boyfriend also thought that she was broken because she didn't like or experience those things. She believed all men wanted those things and all women liked those things and that she would lose him and all boyfriends if she did not comply. She had low self-esteem and low sexual self-esteem. She stayed in a long time, for a long time in a toxic relationship before she finally left. Harry was a student who studied to become a teacher. During his student teaching, teaching practicum, he took a laptop he owned to the school where he was teaching fifth graders. He had access to pornography on the laptop in his off hours. He didn't think about the possibility that a child might access or see some pornography on the laptop when he had it at school. He didn't think about what that outcome might, what might have occurred after that outcome, that it could end his teaching career even before it got started. After we discussed it in therapy, he continued to access pornography on that laptop and to take it to school. He believed he couldn't make himself stop. He put filters on the computer and then he would take them off. He had compulsive sexual behavior and denial. He left school in his last semester and dropped out of there. Hank's wife was temporarily unavailable to set for sex due to illness and a back injury which required surgery. He thought he was entitled to sex, so he started to use internet pornography. He escalated to extremely violent pornography his daughter-in-law was a social worker who worked with sexual abuse victims and was an activist against violent pornography. He felt shame and fear that his wife and his daughter-in-law would suddenly find out. He quit using pornography and told his wife what he'd been doing and wanted her to help him stay away, and she was supportive. He did stay away. Jane came to therapy with distress over the many difficulties in her marriage. In, in addition to the difficulties, her husband had a locked room in the house where he kept his computer. He would not let her in that room. She accessed it when, once, on one occasion, he left it unlocked. She found many cell phones, many charge cards and charge card bills, many online sexual and dating websites in which he had developed many identities, evidence that he prostituted women, as well as made sexual relationships with women in which he used all those identities, and he went to strip clubs. She took the computer to a, a forensic computer analyst and found a massive amount of illegal pornography and many other types of pornography on his computer. He had two young daughters. They separated, reconciled, separated again, and then divorced. Chip wasn't sexually or physically abused in childhood, but felt emotionally deprived because he believed that his father did not approve of him. <clears throat> he felt lonely and unaccepted. He saw a movie in which an eight-year-old girl appeared in her underwear. He developed an attachment to her. As a teen and adult, he masturbated to the images of eight-year-olds. He thought of them as pure, loving, accepting. He claimed the images of the girls were not sexual, even though he was using them for sexual arousal. He had been investigated for images on his computer. He pursued contact with girls, claiming it was innocent. He pursued adult women and believed they wanted sexual attention, even though there was no evidence that they wanted that. He had sexual entitlement, narcissism, and denial. He was, he was arrested, put on the sexual offender registry, no, not allowed to have contact with children, including relatives, and had no internet contact. Charles' brother raped him when he was a child and said he did that to make him feel special. Charles thought all relationships that were special included sex. And so as an adult, Charles wanted to make other children feel special, so he raped them. Until one child said to him, you're making me crazy, and then he stopped. But he said that images of children that he perceived as sexual were the only things that gave him pleasure. It brought on terrible shame. His wife was furious, untrusting, unforgiving, critical, and withholding any form of physical and emotional affection. He had to change careers to one where there was no contact with children. With few exceptions, he did not access uh, pictures of children again. Today, we barely touch the surface of the breadth and the depth of the tsunami of damage caused by sexual exploitation. Toxic emotions, toxic behaviors, toxic beliefs, devastating outcomes. But we, 
But we can't solve these problems by treating the victims and the perpetrators and those caught in the net. We can't fix this by pulling them out of the river one at a time. We have to go upstream and see who or what is pushing them in. Healing is good, prevention is better. But the worst outcome is described by the philosopher Roger Scruton. Pornography and all forms of sexual exploitation threaten the loss of love in a world where only love brings happiness. We must prevent that from happening. So let's take our direction from William Penn, the great founder of Philadelphia, from where I'm from. Let us see what love can do. And then let us do it because we can. Thank you. Thank you so much to all speakers and member, members of our panel. Um, we have a moment for a few short questions. Um, so we have some people with microphones that will come through. We have time for maybe one or two. And I just wanted to thank you all again for sharing your stories and your analysis of this problem. Each story, I feel like, created another mosaic piece that helps us capture the big picture of what the problem is that we're dealing with today. So if you have any questions, if you please raise your hand. We have some microphones so up here at the front. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Davis, and I run a very young nonprofit organization, Human Trafficking Awareness Advocacy Group. But my question today is why are we saying that the average age for human trafficking for girls is 12 to 14 and boys is 11 to 13? How young would you say you would start talking to children about trafficking and pornography and some of the issues that you raise today? Um, well, I can tell you that in Sweden they start because they have the Nord well, the Nordic model, which began as a Swedish model against um, criminalizing the jobs and decriminalizing the women. They start in kindergarten educating about not buying sex. Now, obviously, they don't talk about prostitution. They, in Iceland, they start around first grade with films not about sex, but for example, there's a great film that came out of Iceland where two youngsters are having a hamburger and one doesn't like it and the other one forces the other one to eat it, stuffs it in their mouth, spits it out, and when the person said, you know I didn't like it, they said, yes, you know you like it, I told you you like it. So you do it around like food, what is consent? So there's many ways in which we can get at that. You have to start very early, it has to be developmentally appropriate, but unless we get in there before the pornographers do, and now we know that the pornographers are getting there on seven or eight, then what you're doing is you're in a battle with the pornographers, and you have to sustain and build resilience pre porn and pre porn culture. If not, then we will have a short break. We can come back, be back at 2.30, and there we will start to really take a look at the policy solutions that we have before us to combat this vast problem of sexual exploitation. Thank you very much. There's cookies outside.
You don't need me to write a book around this stuff. No. Yeah. But it turns out you do. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
government high school kids who um, I would read the Washington Post and find out if there was a cabinet member testifying on Capitol Hill, and I'd take the Metro down and sit in the audience just to see a member of the cabinet. Um, and so for me to be able to speak to you all uh, working here on Capitol Hill is, is still a thrill for me. Now that, that nerdy student government uh, kid uh, became a nerdy data professor. And so um, what I'm here to talk to you about is data on what I think is the most trustworthy data that directly links pornography and different public health harms, be that erectile dysfunction, be that sexual violence, be that brain development. And I'm, I do this from a perspective of having worked 25 years to try to figure out how is it that we can prevent sexual violence. And I did my dissertation on that, and I, as I said, wrote several books about it, but I, I worked for so long to try and figure out how do we end sexual violence? And it wasn't until 10 years ago that I realized that the secret ingredient uh, that was missing from putting this together um, was actually not so secret at all. But the secret ingredient in the recipe uh, to end rape was actually pornography. And I've studied that more and more ever since because what I've found is that pornography has rewritten the sexual script for the millennial generation and it is now rewiring the brains of the generation that comes after that. Now, today's um, pornography, as you know, it's uh, not your, your father's Playboy magazine. Uh, obviously, people can get to novel images that are infused with sex and violence on the internet at the drop of a hat. And you heard earlier, about 88% of the scenes in today's internet or in, in today's pornographic movies contain violence, usually by a man towards a woman. Well, I want to give you a follow-up to that research that, that um, is actually from the same study. If you take a look at um, what happens before and after certain things in pornography, it's fascinating. When someone uh, is aggressive towards another, usually a man hitting a woman, when someone is aggressive or violent towards another in porn, 95% of the time, the exact same thing happens. Either that individual, usually a woman, responds with pleasure, where they have no response at all. So wrap your mind around that for a second. A man hits a woman, almost all the time she likes it, or she just has no response. My biggest worry is, what is that doing to the 11-year-old boy who's watching that? He's getting the message, I guess she likes to be hit. What is that doing to the young girl who's watching this? Well, I guess if he hits me, I should like it. And unfortunately, that is what's happening. Now, you've heard a whole lot about what's degrading in pornography. I'm actually going to skip over that because I think we've heard a lot of that already. Because I want to tell you a little bit about the brain. For a, a long time, what we did in the anti-porn movement was to say that pornography objectifies women. And it was a really good logical argument. And it still is a really good logical argument. But now we have data to back that up. And it comes from actually doing MRIs on men as they watch pornography. Look inside their brain. What areas are firing up when they're looking at porn? And when they look at porn, when men look at pornography, the parts of the area, the parts of the brain, the areas of the brain that light up, that are active when they're looking at porn, are the parts of the brain that refer to objects, not to people. So we know from a database perspective that porn objectifies because when when men are looking at it, they're actually thinking of the individual on the screen as an object, not as a person. And why that is so insidious is that when we objectify someone, when we make them less than human, it makes violence against them so much more possible. So what's happening to the brains today of the millennial generation and those that come after it, and, and indeed um, some older people, is that the neural pathways are being rerouted. So what on earth are neural pathways? They're basically different um, lanes of traffic that go throughout the brain. One thing leads to another. I see a hamburger. I want to eat it. Okay, yeah, that goes together. Any number of things. Uh, they get fused together. Well, the way that our brains start out is, uh, at a certain age, you see someone, um, you find them physically attractive, you find them sexually attractive, you want to be with them. Well, what's happening now is, as as teens and people in their 20s and all of these folks watch more and more porn, their brains are rerouted to no longer prefer people, to but to prefer pixels. 
And what high-speed internet pornography has done is it's given them so much novelty, so many different images to look at, so many supranormal stimuli that the brain can't handle them. Okay, so it actually changes. It changes its form to adapt to their environment. And there's actually, and that happens with more and more uh, porn use, of course. There was a recent experimental study done, which is how you determine uh, cause and effect, of course. And what they found was um, the, that men who were exposed to pornography, um, they were unable to delay gratification. And not just sexual gratification, just all over the map. They, they became in tune to being able to press and click for the reward. In, in the case of pornography, obviously, that, you, you would know what that would be. But just in general, in, uh, as a life skill, they lost the ability to delay gratification. They also had problems with their short-term memory, where that slowed down, uh, where they no longer were able to process as many things in their short-term memory. So there are more harms um, than just to, to sexual functioning and, and otherwise. Well, obviously, um, my primary expertise is in sexual violence. And I want to tell you a little bit about the research on the connection between sexual violence and pornography. There are right now a hundred studies that have shown direct connections between pornography and violence. There are now over 50 studies drawing a direct link between pornography and sexual violence. Not one, not two, not over 50. And when the, the same results keep occurring, whether these studies are correlational, whether they're uh, cross-sectional, experimental, longitudinal, no matter really what method we're using, find over and over again a direct link between pornography and sexual violence. Now, please don't mishear me. Everybody who watches porn doesn't commit rape. But there is a direct link, and I'm going to unpack that a bit. Now, one of the things that happens when men, uh, particularly men, watch porn is that they think that they're actually uh, watching, excuse me, they think that women are actually uh, things that exist to sexually please men. And that was a study of 20,000 people. Now, one of the things that porn does is it gives people uh, permission giving beliefs. Now, what's a permission giving belief? It's something in the mind that helps you kind of ignore your conscience, maybe, and say, well, I guess this really is okay. And that's what porn does. Several more studies I want to share with you. One is, we've known for a long time that impulsive men are at more risk for committing sexual violence. Um, well, indeed, if you combine someone who's, who's impulsive with someone who uses pornography frequently, you're going to see a whole lot more sexual violence from that individual. Another common theory as to why rape tends to occur is you, if you have a man who's very much uh, wanting impersonal sex, don't want to know her name, you know, don't want to know anything about her, just want to get, get in, get out, and move on. Okay, if they really want impersonal sex, and they have this hostility towards women. They really just think, you know, women, you know, let me not use the words, but just, just that women are horrible. We've always known that a lot of those guys tend to commit rape, but we, it's not all of them, it, it's just a, a lot of them. Well, then in a study they added in frequent porn use, and then it then became an if, uh, if and when condition. So in other words, if someone had it's interpersonal sex, excuse me, impersonal sex, hostility, and if they're frequent porn users, then they are much more likely to rape. So pornography is like the gasoline on the fire of the individual who wants impersonal sex and hostility. Now, porn is not the sole cause for rape, but it gives men the permission to be sexually violent. And the main point I want to make with you all is that anyone who has an agenda to end sexual violence, you must look at pornography. You must be examining what pornography is doing to this generation and the ones to follow if you want to be effective. Whether that's through legislation, whether that's through prevention programming, or anything, we have got to tackle the public health problem of pornography. Now, you've heard a bit about sexual dysfunction. Here's the interesting thing I want to tell you about that. In the 40s, less than 1% of men had erectile dysfunction. These are men under 30, by the way, um, which is how one would expect. Not many men under 30 would have erectile dysfunction. And then in 1992, it rose to 7%, and more points available. After the internet, high speed uh, access, 33% of men under 30 have erectile dysfunction. We don't really need to wonder too much about what's going on here. Another study found that erectile dysfunction doubled 
uh, in the military in the last 10 years. And in fact, if men are addicted to porn, well over half of them have erectile dysfunction. And they have erectile dysfunction with a person, but not with porn. So I get the question every once in a while, well, haven't you heard about this study that showed that porn and sexual violence aren't connected? Well, okay. You know, in, in the land of social science research, what do we function with? We go with the weight of the evidence. Okay? We go with probabilities. And that's what we have. That we, we're not chemists. Like, some days I wish I were a chemist. You know, it's like mix this and this, it's always going to turn out the same way. People aren't like that. But we deal with probabilities. Well, what I, what I, what I want to um, explain to you is the odds, the collective odds that 50 uh, studies against pornography uh, that, that, that have shown a uh, decrement, excuse me, what are the odds that pornography and sexual violence really aren't connected? What if, what about all these 50 studies that have shown that? What are the odds that they're wrong? Well, here's the odds that they're wrong. One in 88 decillion, one in, in, in 817 million, million, 841 octillion, 977 trillion, 12 sextillion, 523, uh, quintillion, 233 quadrillion, 890 trillion, 533 billion, 447 million, 265,625. <laughs> so you can go with the way of that evidence, or you can deceive yourself. And now, you're talking about 88 this trillion. What is that? And this is my last point. If you were to take pennies, and fill up this whole room with pennies. Can that be a lot of pennies? Obviously. If you were to fill up the Empire State Building, the building I have up here, with pennies, would that be a lot of pennies? I would guess so. Let's try one billion Empire State Buildings full of pennies. The odds that there's no link between porn and sexual violence is walking into one of a billion Empire State Buildings at random, walking to the correct floor to the correct room and picking out that correct penny. Mm. We need to stop thinking, are they connected? and say they definitely are. And we also know that pornography is directly implicating sexual violence all over the place. And what I really want to ask you to do is to start to look at this as a nationwide, in fact, a worldwide public health issue, because it is. And we've got to start doing something about it today. Thank you very much. Your research and analysis of this is so vital on the intersection between sexual violence and pornography, and it really lays the stage for our next speaker, Mr. Truman, and his um, analysis of obscenity, obscenity laws. Patrick Truman is the president of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, and he is a former chief of the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section in the Criminal Division at the U.S. Department of Justice from 1988 to 1993. My talk today is about obscenity and the First Amendment, its relationship, and concluding with the uh, proposition that we must enforce our federal obscenity laws. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution has this phrase, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And the United States Supreme Court has spent over 200 years and hundreds of decisions trying to discern what this phrase means. As examples of what it means, you can see it means the right to use offensive speech, for example, in political campaigns. It even means the right to burn the American flag, the United States Supreme Court says. And it even, the court says, includes the right not to speak. But one thing the court has always maintained is that obscene material is not protected by the First Amendment. The court has said in Miller versus California in its seminal obscenity case, 1973, to equate the free and robust exchange of ideas in political debate with commercial exploitation of obscene material demeans the grand conception of the First Amendment and its high purpose in the historic struggle for freedom. It is a misuse of the great guarantees of free speech and the press. And yet you hear over and over again, all pornography is protected by the Constitution. 
The court has held that even if the obscene material is distributed to consenting adults, people who mind, it is still not protected material. Now, why isn't it protected? Well, I've read many, many cases, all the cases the court has uh, written on obscene material, and this, I think, is the most important quote, and it has to do with what, what the reason why we're here today. The sum of experience affords an ample basis for legislatures to conclude that a sensitive key relationship of human existence, central to family life, community welfare, and the development of human personality, can be debased and distorted by crass commercial exploitation of sex. The states and Congress have the power to make a morally neutral judgment, that's important, that public exhibition of obscene material or commerce in such material has a tendency to injure the community as a whole, to endanger the public safety, or to jeopardize the state's right to maintain a decent society. That's why we enforce the law. Now, the key question, of course, is how do we determine whether a work is obscene, whether it's a picture, a film, or a book? The court has had many tests over the years, and it settled in 1973 on a very workable standard, a standard that's very understandable to jurors. And this is the reason why the vast majority, almost every case brought in this country on obscene material has uh, gone to a jury has resulted in a conviction. The three-part test is that the material itself must appeal to a prurient interest, is patently offensive, and lacks serious value. I mean, this is not meant to be a continuing legal education seminar. So I'm just talking about this in more layman's terms. Uh, but the three-part test then, are prurient interest, it has to be a prurient interest, what's that? It's a lustful interest. Is it intended to be pornographic? Well, that's the real important question. Because what the court says is it doesn't actually have to appeal itself, but instead it's how the material is handled. What was it intended to be? Is it intended to be a medical textbook or a pornographic work? Just because a doctor might get sexually aroused by looking at sexually explicit images in a medical textbook does not mean that that textbook is obscene. It wasn't pandered so, it wasn't intended to be so. However, a pornographic work is something different. It's the intent or the purpose of the material. The second thing is it must be patently offensive. Now this is important. Does the work depict or describe in a patently offensive way sexual conduct? And the test here is not whether the buyer of that pornography would find it patently offensive. They want that, especially someone who is addicted. They don't consider it patently offensive. When prosecutors argue this prong to the jury, they might say, would you have a porn film running on your iPad while you're sitting on a city bus? Why not? Of course you wouldn't. You wouldn't, you wouldn't because it's patently offensive. And you wouldn't have this work playing on a coffee table uh, if you had your neighbors over for a Christmas party. Why not? It's patently offensive. The third prong is that the work must be without serious value. No literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So, this is the last test. And the pornographers, in all the cases we've ever been involved in, when I was chief of the Justice Department, unit prosecuting this. All the pornographers would say that my porn film is artistic. But then you read to the jury the, the box cover of that pornographic film, and it's, they describe the film in the most violent, uh, sexually facing way, that the jury says, well, that obviously wasn't intended to be art. Uh, Miller requires, Miller's Supreme Court case, requires that contemporary community standards be taken into account on whether prong one or prong two are, uh, when you're looking at those tests. Now this is important because the court uh, wants you to know that just because something was found obscene 30 years ago doesn't mean it's obscene today. Community standards may have changed. But also the community standards of Manhattan City don't necessarily equate to the community standards in Manhattan, Kansas. And something that's obscene in Manhattan, Kansas may not necessarily be obscene in New York City. Personal opinion doesn't count also. 
But what the jury has to decide is whether the mythical average person in my community would find that this work appeals to a lustful interest and is patently offensive. Now, uh, what you often have are juries that want to, uh, jurors who want to substitute their own opinion, but the court doesn't allow that. Before the jury goes back to deliberate, the court says that you have to find not what your opinion is, but whether the work in, this, in your community would be patently offensive and appeal to a prurient interest uh, according to your community standards. Miller, in plain words, and I won't read this whole thing, but what the court says is that, you can, that it's right for legislatures to uh, outlaw sexual acts or even lascivious exhibition of the genitals. So it doesn't have to be a sexual act. It could be even simulated sexual acts that can be found to be obscene. It's quite broad. What are the laws today on the books uh, on the federal law? Federal law today prohibits the distribution of obscene material or hardcore pornography, those terms are synonymous, on the internet. Yet hardcore pornography is all over the internet. It prohibits the distribution of hardcore pornography or obscenity on cable or satellite TV. Comcast makes a fortune off the sale of obscene videos and they defend it. But if the Attorney General of the United States would merely make an announcement that we're now going to enforce federal obscenity laws against all distributors, including uh, satellite or cable companies, you would see Comcast change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It prohibits distribution of hardcore pornography on hotel and motel television. It prohibits you from just being in the business of selling obscene material for hardcore pornography. So that porn shop in our communities that has the adult back room where they're renting hardcore porn films, that is a violation of federal law. Now, the court has also said that you have a right to possess obscene material in the privacy of your own home. But, the court says, you don't have a right then to distribute it and you don't even have a right to receive it. So what is the value of that right? That's often argued in these cases. But it's the commerce in this uh, debased material that the court concerns itself. The last federal obscenity trial was five years ago, and it was in Los Angeles, California. Ira Isaacs, a prominent pornographer, was prosecuted and convicted in a jury trial right in Los Angeles, California. But not to worry, his defense attorney said, after the conviction. We're taking this appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the most liberal circuit in the country, and this conviction will be overturned. And yet the Ninth Circuit upheld that conviction. And my point is that you can win a case in Los Angeles, California, you can win any place in the country. Most states have workable laws against pornography. The retail distribution of pornography does not. So it's not just the federal. Why do we prosecute pornography? I give you three reasons there are many. Number one, the law is a great teacher. If we're prosecuting those hardcore pornographic films that Gail Dines described, the sexually violent films, then that might teach the American public that sexual violence against women is a bad thing. The law is a great teacher. Second, it causes pornographers to self-regulate. When we were prosecuting cases all around the country, the most prominent defense attorney, Paul Cambria, put out what he called Cambria's List, and every porn company in the country had that posted in their distribution center. And, and it told what kind of films you should not produce and should not distribute because it's a guaranteed conviction. Films involving sexual violence, films involving uh, uh, child themes, single child pornography, uh, etc. And so prosecuting causes self-regulation. And the third thing is it establishes community standards. What are the standards in your hometown? We don't know. Because the Attorney General of the United States for several years hasn't prosecuted uh, hardcore pornography. So what are the community standards? They become anything goes in your community. That's the standard. But if you prosecute, you find out right away that most people in a jury trial, when they have to look at this kind of film, will say, this is beyond our community standards. Even though people in our community enjoy this, we're better than that when we make convictions. It establishes community standards. My conclusion is the enforcement of obscenity laws is a critical part of the overall strategy to halt the public health crisis of pornography 
and to curb all sexual exploitation. Thank you very much. And thank you for explaining the role of obscenity law in stopping and preventing sexual exploitation in pornography. Speaking of preventing um, sexual exploitation, Lisa Thompson comes to speak to us about the role of demand. She's for commercial sexual exploitation. Lisa is the Vice President of Education and Outreach at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, where she oversees Nicosi's strategic plan for increased public understanding of sexual exploitation-related issues. Lisa. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So, as uh, Ailey was just explaining, I'm going to be discussing the demand for commercial sex and how it contributes to the formation of something that I, I call the global supply chain of sexual exploitation. Now, before we can really get into the substance of that, what, what I mean by all that, we have to lay a little ground. <coughs> so, to begin, I want to talk about systems of prostitution. Systems of prostitution exist to cater to the fulfillment of male, male sexual wants. And the majority of those that are used to satisfy those sexual wants are female. So in other words, prostitution is a form of gender-based sexual exploitation. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, what about the men who buy sex from boys or the men who buy sex from men or transgender people? But the operative word there was men. It's men who are buying the sex from men, boys, and transgender persons. You could look the world over, but you're not going to find a corollary female market of any kind of quantity buying and engaging in prostitution systems as you will men. So unfortunately, what we're dealing with is something that is you know, pretty much driven by a consumer base that is primarily men. Now, any discussion about about prostitution, the commercial sex industry is very much rooted in how you think about sex and your and a philosophy that you bring to it. So the philosophy that, we're, that I'm putting forth today is an abolitionist one. And as part of that philosophy, we view that human sexual relationships that are devoid of intimacy, uh, mutuality of pleasure, reciprocity of affection, and genuine consent, that those are inherently dehumanizing. In other words, you have to look for these things if you want to find authentic, healthy human sexual relationships. Now, if you start, <laughs> if, and if you are missing any of those in a relationship, maybe a red flag should go up. But if you start applying these, if you start looking for these markers within the sex trade, within the systems of prostitution, you won't see a red flag, you'll see a sea of red flags. They're waving everywhere because these simply are not there. And in fact, the very reason that people are seeking sex from systems of prostitution is because they don't want these things. They want to have sex with no strings attached. They want sex that can detach from intimacy and humanity and emotional and from real human connection. They, they're not looking for that. And ultimately, you know, these are the th these things are so important because this is what if, if you how, how else are we just having sex in any way that's different from animals? Really, I mean, if you start, uh, because sex just becomes a raw act uh, that some an itch that you scratch, and it really is utterly meaningless. Now, a second major point in this philosophy is that sexual intercourse for money is, by its nature, an act of coercion. Okay, so any really any kind of sexual exchange for money is, in and of itself, an act of sexual coercion. Now, when you think about what prostitution is. Is the practice of engaging in sexual activity for some for payment. So, by the, what, and what are they doing? Like they're using this payment. Someone is using payment in order to overcome someone's will, because the, the person doesn't want to have sex with you. You're having to use your money, your power that you have from you know, whether it's you can provide housing or maybe you're providing drugs or whatever it is. You've got something that you're using as leverage in order to overcome the will of this other person in order to have him have sex back with you. So by its very nature, commercial, all commercial sex is a form of sexual exploitation. It's coercive. So there, you know, if we need all this then encapsulate, we've got two primary problems with any kind of system of prostitution. It's inherently dehumanizing, because it 
doesn't fulfill the essential hallmarks of authentic, healthy sexual relationships and because it depends upon some type of financial inducement in order to coerce a sexual exchange. So when you then look at other forms of commercial sex, again, you know, things like pornography, stripping, webcamming, again, these people are engaging in sexual activity with someone in order to obtain money. So this falls within our window of sexual exploitation. This falls within that definition. But again, what I'm trying to say is that all these forms of commercial sex are constitute forms of prostitution, and they also constitute forms of sexual exploitation. Now, additionally, we would argue that the harm of prostitution is not restricted to the conditions by which it's carried out, but that it exists in the very carrying out of prostitution itself. So we establish that it's unhealthy and dehumanizing, that it's coercive. So of course, the very carrying out of, of commercial sex acts is dehumanizing, is exploitive, is harmful. And we would even argue that prostitution is ontologically, in its essence, a form of violence. Now, I've got 10 minutes to give you this talk. <laughs> and normally, we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about the violence of prostitution. I don't have time to do that today, but I do want to point out to you that we have a booklet um, that's been available um, out on the table, registration table, uh, that documents in, in, from research studies the intensive violence that is experienced by those who participate in, in the sex trade. So uh, please check that out. But just so you think I'm not making this up, and that you're thinking, oh, she's just being hyperbolic, or she's exaggerating, I want you to hear from the women who survive prostitution themselves and how they characterize the kind of sex that they experience when they're being bought. How do they describe it? Well, they talk about it as, they say things like, well, it's pay as you go rape. It's been described as being raped for a living. Or as um, one woman said to Melissa Farley, what rape is to others is normal to us. So the, the very ambiance of what's going on at all these sex exchanges, whether or not the, the sex buyer is violently holding them down and taking sex from them or not, just the ambiance of their everyday experiences, it feels like rape to them. Now ultimately then, prostitution, whole sex trade, the, the, you know, the stripping, pornography, the webcamming, these are turning those who are sold into public sexual commodities. Now those of you and I, you know, we're sitting here today and we have sexual autonomy. We're not available right, in this public market. But what the sex trade is all about is taking, taking, creating a pool of people who are available on demand to be purchased for sex. And that these are the essential and indispensable elements of the, the, the market of the sex trade. Now, Shamir spoke earlier about the demand uh, quite eloquently. But what we're talking about there is just the consumers. These, who are these people who are, who are buying these people who are, who are offered as public sexual commodities? They're the ones who comprise the demand. This, is, this whole market exists for them. And unfortunately, the primary actors of this are men. These are the men who are purchasing the sex sex. And again, in a limited time today, there's, there's so little. How can I begin to explain what this is like? But so I'm going to use a picture, which I hope will encapsulate this without me having to say a whole lot. This is from a, an article that was taken some time ago. It was 2004. An article on trafficking um, in Mexico discussing the sex trade there. And you see how this woman has become a public sexual commodity. And you can see quite clearly who the man is. This now, the issue of supply chains. Uh, I'm hearing more and more about supply chains, particularly as it applies to the issue of labor trafficking. But I think it's vitally important that we look at the same issue and apply it to the issue of commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. Supply chains are simply networks that a company and a supplier use to produce a specific product. And supply chains include every business that comes into contact with a particular product. So when we're talking about the sex trade, we're talking, we have the primary suppliers, the pornography, those who produce pornography, 
the strip joints, the live sex shows, the sex tour operators, the internet-based prostitution, street-level prostitution, and brothels of a wide range of uh, sorts, in often like massage parlors and sports clinics and so on. These are the primary uh, people who are supplying the demand. But you have the secondary structure, those who support it, who often profit from it, the tourism industry, taxi drivers, security firms, accountants, lawyers, advertisers, doctors, public health sector, ISPs, even governments, who are all invested in maintaining this global supply chain of commercial sexual exploitation. So ultimately then, this is a global system that's existing around the world. You can hardly find a place where it's not there. And so the commercial sexual enterprises, both the primary and the secondary, who are supplying persons for the purposes of sexual exploitation constitute the global supply chain of organized sexual exploitation. And I use the word organized very strategically. By this I mean that they're planned, it's controlled, and often by very powerful groups. It has a massive profitability and scale. We don't have time to go into the profits from the industry worldwide, but this was just from one study that was conducted in 2014 looking at the underground commercial sex economies. But I really want to point out here just a couple of things. That the sex traffickers who were interviewed for this study, their weekly income ranged from $5,000 a month to 33, excuse me, a week, $5,000 a week to $33,000 a week. And moreover, that pricing for sex act was as low as $5 and ranged all the way up to like $1,000 per sex act. Looking at India, about 2.5 million women are believed to be in prostitution there, 100,000 of them in Mumbai alone, prostituting 365 days a year for $2 per sex act. And one of the red light districts there generates about $400 million in revenue annually. So I asked them, how many sex acts does it take to make, when you're paying $2 a sex act, to make $400 million? That's a whole lot of sex buyers. That's a whole lot of demand. And then um, I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time. But ultimately, the, the global supply chain of organized sexual exploitation exists to cater to and profit from one class of individual, and that is the male commercial sex buyer. And the organized system of sexual exploitation is a manifestation of men's choices and male demand that women's bodies be sold as public sexual commodities. And who are these individuals? A lot of them are regular guys. You know, um, people that you ride the bus with, take the taxi with, go to work with, maybe even having, you know, maybe your own, maybe you live at home. Mm. Their attitudes can be incredibly callous. You see the inhumanity, the, the attitudes in this instance, the guy said, for me, being with a prostitute is not a relationship. It's like having a cup of coffee when you're done and you throw it out. Another example, he said, it's like going to the toilet. <laughs> so the main message then is that any serious effort to combat commercial sexual exploitation must include vigorous efforts to reduce the demand for commercial sex. How do we do that? Well, we have a few proposals that we have laid out in the Freedom from Sexual Exploitation Agenda, and I encourage everyone to take time to review that document. I'm going to just make two quick points because I have my time. Uh, but I want to point out our suggestion that the U.S. military create a rule whereby, whereby restrict all U.S. military personnel from visiting strip clubs. If there's one thing this government could do quickly, easily, and that would have a monumental international impact on the commercial sex trade, it would be instituting this, this strip club ban. And I also want to say that any efforts to combat demand have to include a holistic approach that take into account programs that help those who are currently caught up in the system of organized sexual exploitation. Um, they will, you know, very likely suffer consequences, but we have to concentrate our efforts on reducing the demand so that future people do not have to fill the system. And so with that, 
just want to leave you with this notion that sexploitation is a nice job and that people deserve better than prostitution. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. As you've all seen on the headlines recently, sexual assaults and violence in the military, sexual exploitation in the military in general is a problem that is really facing our country at this time. Here to speak to us about that is Dan O'Brien. He is an advocate in the battle against human sex trafficking. He was a 2015 to 2016 fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. He has served as the chairman of the board of directors of Shareholder International and now remains on the board. Uh, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Um, as was just said, I had the opportunity and the privilege to be at Harvard the last uh, year and a half, where I could study and research and speak on um, the issues of human sex trafficking here in the United States and throughout the world. To say that it's a crime of shocking brutality and a gross violation of basic human rights is an understatement. Today I'll be addressing a topic that is especially uh, close to my heart. Um, I was an Air Force JAG, I was a prosecutor, I was a defense attorney, I was a professor at the Air Force Academy. My wife and I have, um, uh, are proud parents of two sons, a daughter, and a son-in-law that are all graduates of the Air Force Academy. We're a military family. You know, the U.S. Department of Defense is very aware of its responsibility to eliminate sexual assault among its personnel and to ensure that its members do not engage in activities that support human trafficking. In 2014, they requested the Rand Institute uh, to, to do an init initiate an independent study of the, to assess the sexual assault and sexual harassment within the military. The survey found that approximately 20,000 military members had experienced a sexual assault in the past year. That is unacceptable. The Combating Trafficking in Persons program, the CTEP program, is tasked with implementing DOD's policy of opposing prostitution and any related activities contributing to the phenomenon of trafficking in persons. CTEP has mandated general awareness web-based training. This is training my kids do. Well, those are the military. It's an annual thing that has to be done. And they're taught how to look and recognize their human trafficking so they can report it. And while the military should be applauded for recognizing they have a problem and for taking some steps to remedy it, there's much more that they can and must do. As you've already heard today, pornography is an evil that impacts all of the segments of our society, including the military, in a very big way. And we could spend days addressing that, but we don't have to. We know what's out there. We know what's happening every day. I'm totally in agreement with Nicosi's position that DOD should require annual training about the dangers of pornography. That's a must. That can be done as well as random sweeps uh, for pornography on personal computers, as well as the office computers in military establishments. But another action that has already been highlighted a little bit today by other speakers that could be taken and should be taken would have an immediate impact. And that would be to place gentlemen's clubs, strip clubs, and when I say gentlemen's clubs, folks, there's no such thing. They don't exist. But to place them off limits for military personnel would have a direct impact. This would send a clear and resounding message that it's not going to be business as usual. That the military culture of boys will be boys has got to become a part of our past. Strip clubs provide the perfect learning environment for sexually toxic attitudes and behaviors. Leering and jeering and sexual touching and lap dancing are everyday occurrences in strip clubs throughout the world and right outside the gates of our bases. In VIP rooms and strip clubs throughout the world, prostitution and sexual acts and trafficking 
or the norm. Military members cannot, listen to this, cannot exploit and objectify women in one environment without it having an impact on every area of their lives, including their military service and their relationships with their sisters in arms. Additionally, strip clubs are well-known fronts for prostitution and trafficking. Karen Hughes, who spent 35 years with the Las Vegas Police Department, including eight years as the head of their vice department, has a lifetime of experience dealing with the realities of these strip clubs. The owners of strip clubs understand they're in a dirty business. The men who come to these clubs don't come for the overpriced drinks. They come for the fantasy girl and the potential for a happy ending. No strip club anywhere in this country or the world survives without the possibility of those sex acts. They just don't. Strip club managers have to balance and it's a delicate balance between providing an environment that keeps predatory males from coming back and yet staying within the so-called legal limits. And don't kid yourselves, there aren't legal limits. Everything goes. Pimps become regular customers, and they bring in young girls, and they break down their inhibitions, and there's drugs that are involved to cover the, the terrible abuse these young ladies have every day. They pay off security guards as part of the management so that they can bring in their girls and recruit others. Occasionally, the management secretly will you know, cooperate with the police and maybe give up a, a dirty pen, maybe with a girl. That takes them off the watch list so that because they know the police will start looking at the other places. This is a big money business and the balancing act is constant. In conclusion, Ms. Hughes stated that during her entire career of 30 some years, none of the strip clubs were clean. And she's also seen a troubling trend that prostitution is moving off the streets into the strip clubs. As pimps and members of organized crime understand, there's a protection being in strip clubs. The problem for law enforcement is a lack of resources and the time that it's required to run good sting operations. Every police department has a limited financial amount of assets, and they have to continue to train new officers that have the skills to get deep into the VIP rooms and the back rooms of these strip clubs. It takes large quantities of cash to get there. And our law enforcement don't have those resources. It's a crime that seems to have no end. The FBI has taken a lead role in fighting trafficking and has established traff task forces throughout the nation, partnering with local, state, and other federal law enforcement agencies. A warning sign of human trafficking, they know is strip clubs. The FBI has stated that certain locations, such as truck stops, massage parlors, and strip clubs, often are used by traffickers to force victims into the sex trafficking world. An FBI task force in Portland, Oregon, a hotspot for human trafficking, found a huge overlap between strip clubs and the sex trade. That's a big surprise, right? We know that. Everybody knows that. One member of the task force stated, it's no secret that pimps and traffickers will go to strip clubs to find, try to find girls to traffic and promote and to compel them to prostitution. In another investigation of four strip clubs that was led by the FBI, the IRS, and local police, graphic court filings detailed how the dimly lit VIP rooms, dancers and patrons engaged in open sex acts for money. And here's what drives me crazy. The one fact that is indisputable is that the close proximity of strip clubs to bases throughout the world. As an example, Fort Bragg in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the Army's largest military base with 50,000 troops. It has a number of strip clubs right out the gate of Fort Bragg Street. 
Fayetteville, with a population of 200,000 people, has the duty assigned to be the third ranked city per capita of strip clubs in the entire nation. There are 15 strip clubs right in that small town. The Naval Base is stationed at Norfolk, the largest Navy base in the Navy, and Langley Air Force Base are separated by 21 miles. The Marine Base at Camp Lejeune, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, town is 60,000. A quick Google search finds five strip clubs in Jacksonville for that small town and 21 in the vicinity of Langley and the Naval Station in Norfolk. Military discounts are common because it's no secret who keeps those clubs open. The bottom line is, is that the sexual assault crisis is not occurring in a vacuum. Consumption of sexual performances and commercial sex acts at strip clubs by U.S. military personnel instilled the very notions of sexual privilege and entitlement that leads to sexual assault and creates a culture that enables sex trafficking. The infamous juice bars outside the gates of our bases in South Korea offer a perfect example of what can be done. A few years ago, there were 55 juicy bars outside the gates of Osaka. That's where young women would stand outside and try to get our young servicemen to go in there and pay high prices for non-alcoholic drinks. But it was the start of the negotiation for sex acts. Prostitution and dental servitude were so well known in those places, everybody knew. The Air Force made an effort to put those juicy bars out of business. In 2013, by making them off limits, they reduced the number from 55 to 9. The whole tone outside the gate changed. Lieutenant General Jean-Marc Truest said, I've had many airmen that have come out and said, I just didn't want to go there. I didn't want to go outside the gate because it was so seedy. While Korea illustrates a regional success, it also highlights the weakness of DOD's CETA policy as it's currently written. All our military bases have an armed forces disciplinary control board, which is tasked with making establishments that present conditions which adversely affect the health, safety, morale, and morals to our military person off limits. Do you think strip clubs might affect the morals of our young men and women? Of course they do. In my lengthy interview with uh, General Drewis, he made it abundantly clear that although he faced challenges within the military when he wanted to do this to the juicy bars, and he had, but he had a staff that was outstanding that was willing to fight the good fight. And as he stated, it's absolutely critical that the military presents a consistent message to our troops currently, and we're currently just not doing that. He went on to add that making strip clubs off limits worldwide is a decision that would help change the culture of boys being boys. Now, why doesn't the disciplinary board work? Number one, it applies to businesses within the local area. Number two, procedural process time. You have to File the paperwork, you have to get a notification, you have to have an appeal process. That takes time. It's designed to deal with just one type of business, not a class of businesses. And different commanders interpret the rules differently, creating different results. And finally, installation commanders, folks, they don't have the time to do this. Their responsibilities should not be involved here. Their job is to train our men and women to fight and win our wars. So the recommendations. Amend DOD CETA policy to place strip clubs and sexually oriented business off limits to all military personnel worldwide. That can be done. Two, amend DOD CETA policy to require annual training about the dangers of pornography. And three, amend DOD CETA policy to require random sweeps for pornography on computers, private and in the office. To conclude, our military is the most highly respected institution in our nation. Not anything is even close. And yet, we've seen the scandals with the Marines photo sharing, scandal that's hit the papers the last couple of weeks, the Navy scandal with admirals having sex and getting paid money and prostitutes. It's the time for decisive action. We don't need any more studies to tell us what we already know. That's right. We know what's happening. So it's time for military leaders to lead, to change the rules that they can do. It's within their ability to do that. 
And it's our job, if they don't, to hold their feet to the fire. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That concludes this panel. We have a brief moment for any questions. And we'll have some people coming up and down the aisles with microphones. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. Patrick, can, uh, can we assume now that in the new administration, the Justice Department is going to go back to the time that, uh, that you worked there? Well, we do know that Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions, in his Senate confirmation hearing, was asked if he would enforce the federal obscenity laws, and he said uh, that he would vigorously enforce those laws. So we can only take him at his word. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. I don't think you have at the Justice Department right now trained prosecutors, but that was the case when I came on board. Uh, we had to bring in experts who trained the uh, staff and trained the U.S. attorneys, or 93 U.S. attorneys around the country, trained uh, someone there. But it took leadership by the Attorney General who, back, back then who required that every U.S. Attorney's Office, all 93, send one person to Washington to be trained, and there was sort of an ongoing, continuing education for them. That's what it's going to take, because the pornographers are all geared up for this. And by the way, federal law doesn't prosecute the individual that could. We're looking at the prosecution of major producers and distributors, and the internet distributors. <laughs> I have one question actually to follow up on the obscenity law. Um, what has, as obscenity law has been prosecuted and enforced in the past, what were the results in pornography and shooter and culture when those laws were not enforced? Well, as I said uh, briefly in my talk, virtually every case in the country, whether the state or federal, was won. When I was there in every trial that we had, we got a lot of conviction. Sometimes if, when you bring a conviction against a producer, it might be a husband and wife or a production company. Juries typically will let the wife off if they have kids and they'll let the more prosecute the man. So we had some that didn't get convicted even though they're equally uh, 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 liable. But uh, many people have said, well, today you wouldn't get a conviction because the culture has changed. And I think it might be just the opposite because now on your juries, you're going to have every man, every woman, who has seen the damage that pornography has done to themselves, to their family, to their community. So I don't believe that today you would have a much different result at all. Any other questions? All right, thank you once again for our panel. <laughs>
the sex trade, and gender-based violence and discrimination. The question often arises as to the relationship between sex trafficking and the sex trade, including prostitution and pornography. Human trafficking operates under market equations of supply and demand. Labor trafficking thrives on the demand for cheap goods and forced labor, and as it relates to sex trafficking, it is the demand for prostitution that fuels the multi-billion dollar sex trade. Under these market rules, the sex trade operates as vast economies of unflinching exploitation. From an international legal perspective, the laws in place are sterling tools. In particular, the, the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, or the Palermo Protocol, which the United States has ratified in 2005, provides the internationally agreed upon definition of human trafficking. The Palermo Protocol lists the means through which a trafficker operates, including abuse of power over persons with acute vulnerabilities, so acute that the consent of a victim to her trafficking is never a defense in a court of law. The Palermo Protocol also calls on governments to punish the demand side of trafficking, and this definition of trafficking also applies to pimping. Nationally, the U.S. State Department recognizes that without, I quote, demand for commercial sex, sex trafficking would not exist in its form as it does today. Also, the National Security Presidential Directive 22 instructs federal agencies to strengthen efforts to combating human trafficking by recognizing the activities such as prostitution, pimping, pandering, and brothel owning as contributions to the phenomenon of trafficking in persons. And this formalizes the US government's opposition to prostitution and related activity, activities as inherently harmful and dehumanizing. Furthermore, Article 138.34 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice prohibits pandering by compelling, inducing, enticing, or procuring an act of prostitution to name a few US, relevant US policies. One of the ways to combat sex trafficking is to examine the national and jurisdictional legal frameworks that govern prostitution, of which there are three major models. Some people say there are four, but I stick to the fact that there are three. One, full criminalization, um, which is the case in the United States, in every state of the United States, except a few counties in Nevada. Two, legalization and its worst form, decriminalization, where the buying and selling of human beings for sex is legal, uh, with examples of such frameworks in Germany, the Netherlands, certain states in Australia, and New Zealand when it comes to decriminalization. And three, demand-focused legislation, whereby prostituted individuals are decriminalized and offered comprehensive services, while the purchase of sex is held accountable under the law. This model is also known as the Swedish, the Nordic, and now more recently, the Quality model. So what are the implications for each of these uh, legal frameworks? Number one, full criminalization of prostitution fails to recognize the vulnerabilities of prostituted individuals and punishes them for their own exploitation at the hands of their traffickers and their pimps. Furthermore, other than a few groundbreaking demand-focused uh, de uh, initiatives in Seattle, Washington, Cook County, Illinois, and other cities, there is a discriminatory impact of our prostitution laws that leads to dis disproportionate arrests of women and the transgender population who are often brutalized in the process, uh, unfortunately by law enforcement as well, while the sex buyers are rarely apprehended. The Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act of 2015 calls on the Department of Justice to prosecute those who, I quote, solicit or patronize victims of human trafficking and traffic children for the purpose of commercial sex acts. These measures are an excellent start in addressing the demand for prostitution, but we must accelerate implementation efforts and also ensure that comprehensive services, including housing, legal, and medical services, are offered to those trafficked and prostituted. Number two, decriminalization and legalization of the sex trade are unmitigated disasters in every country where these laws have passed. Local authorities in the Netherlands, Germany, and Australia, where pimping, sex buying, and brothel owning are legalized, struggle to contain the massive illegal 
sex trade and organized crime that thrives under these legal frameworks. Up to 90% of women and girls in brothels across Europe are undocumented foreign women and girls um, from the poorest countries of Eastern Europe and in the global south. And they have been deemed to be trafficked. Germany hosts countrywide multi-story chain brothels in which sex buyers are offered menus from which, uh, from which sex buyers can choose sexual acts, some of which amount to torture. Since New Zealand passed its decriminalization law, the government found that street prostitution doubled in Auckland between 2006 and 2007, so the numbers now must be exponentially more, with an overwhelming representation of Maori, Pacific Islanders, and Polynesian women and girls in the sex trade. New Zealand is also a destination, according to the US State Department, for traffic women from China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, and Vietnam, and a source country for child sex trafficking, again, mostly from indigenous populations. Three, uh, the Swedish or Nordic model. On February 14, 2017, last month, the Republic of Ireland followed Sweden, Iceland, Norway, South Korea, and Canada, each with some exceptions, Northern Ireland, and most recently France, in enacting the Swedish or Nordic model. These governments have recognized, one, that prostitution is a form of gender-based violence and discrimination, two, that sex buyers are the bedrock of the highly profitable sex trade, and three, that without them, the sordid multi-billion dollar business would collapse and sex traffickers have no place to park their prey. As a result of its 1999 law, Sweden has documented, documented a decrease in street prostitution and sex trafficking, although sex trafficking online is, is, uh, is offering many, many challenges uh, as we see around the world. And more importantly, a normative cultural shift whereby the vast majority of the Swedish population now believes that purchasing sex is not only unacceptable, but that it is a, a barrier to gender uh, equality. The government of Norway has also published an independent report finding that its demand-focused 2009 law has reduced the prostitution uh, market. So here we are, we have wonderful uh, human rights and gender equality frameworks to date. So what are the barriers that are holding us from gaining progress? For one, the lucrative sex trade and its supporters have crafted a powerful narrative by co-opting deeply held democratic principles of freedom, agency, and choice to mainstream the sex trade, including prostitution and pornography. To promote their agenda to normalize exploitation, they also misuse the equally evocative concepts of sex and work, which resonate with our common sense of worth, dignity, and rights. By coining the phrase sex work, the sex trade has enlisted the media, the entertainment industry, and even the United Nations and some human rights organizations to create a dangerous storyline supporting men's right to buy unfettered sexual access. It is a narrative that defines the exchange of money for sexual harassment, violence, power, and control as consent. Survivors of the sex trade tell us that prostitution is neither sex nor work, but the deepest manifestation of dehumanization and an extension of childhood sexual and economic violence, of incest, rape, homelessness, or persecution from sexual identities. The human rights of prostituted women are indistinguishable from the human rights of non-prostituted women. Prostitution in all its forms, from pornography to strip clubs, from escort services to the most recent phenomenon of sugar death daddies, is not an exception to gender-based violence. It is its cause and its consequence. Every day, we combat myriad efforts promoting the decriminalization and legalization of the sex trade globally, which are heavily funded by powerful donors, including the Open Society Foundation, and through its HIV AIDS program, the Gates Foundation, and many others. For instance, UN AIDS and other UN agencies have endorsed the decriminalization of prostitution as a way to combat HIV AIDS. While combating HIV AIDS is critically urgent, these policies have limited to no analyses of gender-based violence and can be interpreted as investing more in the health of sex buyers and their families rather than that of prostituted women. 
In 2013, UN Women distributed a note entitled Sex Work, Sexual Exploitation, and Trafficking, supporting UNAIDS' call for decolonization in violation of international law. Amnesty International passed a resolution in 2016 calling on governments to decriminalize prostitution, or as they describe it, quote, adult consensual sex work, end quote, in effect creating a so-called human right for men to purchase women for sex in violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Law. I stand by my characterization of the Amnesty International policy on decriminalization of prostitution as one promoting gender apartheid. And why do I say that? This policy sets aside and apart two categories of women, one that deserves access to economic and educational opportunities to a work environment free of sexual harassment and a life free of violence, and the other, a class of women and girls and the trans population whom they condemn to the sex trade and to a future without vision. Amnesty International did not pass a resolution supporting poor men to enter into debt bondage, nor is it promoting the sale of organs as socioeconomic empowerment. So why the exception for the most disenfranchised women and girls from the Global South, Indigenous, Aboriginal, First Nations, Roma, African or African descent, or so-called caste systems, or exploitation? And I am running out of time. <laughs> I just want to say, equally disturbing was the recent publication of the Movement for Black Lives platform, which calls on states to pass legislation decriminalizing prostitution. As an African American woman who has dedicated her life to ensuring equality and discrimination, that the Movement for Black Lives would endorse <laughs> pimping and sex buying as socioeconomic solutions for black women is unfathomable. So we urge the Department of Justice of State, USAID, to continue making clear that the sex trade, including prostitution, is the bedrock of sex trafficking, and that prostitution is not more of a choice for women than its female genital mutilation, child marriage, polygamy, intimate partner violence, or any other human rights violation based on sex inequality. Thank you. in our world, sexual exploitation has also moved online. And so now we will narrow the scope of our discussion to looking at some specific laws that can be improved in order to combat sexual exploitation. Doing that with us today is Samantha Bartman, Senior Director at the Chair of International, um, which is a nonprofit working to prevent sex trafficking and restore and bring justice to survivors. She has directed the demand research for the U.S. Department of State and the Domestic Minor Sex Trafficking for the US Department of Justice. Thank you. Good afternoon. On the first panel today, we heard Shamir McKenzie speak so well to the problem of demand, and we've heard that theme iterated throughout today. Um, in 2006, Sheriff Hope began researching that issue of demand, and in 2007, we published a report called Demand. Um, in that report, we also highlighted the key role that facilitators play when we talk about sex trafficking. At that time, we were really looking at facilitators as tangible, hard venues, casinos, strip clubs, taxi cab operators. We did know that there was a problem with, with the internet as well, but it wasn't really until uh, several years later, when Craigslist.com became the target of an inquiry about the amount of sex trafficking occurring online. And Craigslist.com became the rally cry for those of us trying to stem that flow. Well, that flow has not been stemmed. And Craigslist.com's um, independent decision to remove their adult services webpage did not solve the problem, much like um, any individual entity choosing to do that would solve the problem. So it brings me to the discussion that I am going to have today, which is about the Communications Decency Act of 1996, Yawn. Nobody quite understands the 
importance of this particular piece of legislation when it comes to stemming this flow of sex trafficking on the internet. It's a critical piece of legislation with many essential provisions relating to the internet. The problem we face in the anti-trafficking community today is section 230 of the CDA. This section contains protections for certain internet businesses that are inadvertently blocking access to justice by victims of sex trafficking. Section 230 and the CDA was enacted four years before the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, the TVPA. This, the TVPA, I'm sure everybody has heard about it as the cornerstone of our trafficking legislation. The protections in the CDA Section 230 directly conflict with the protections and remedies given to sex trafficking victims under the TVPA, and it's becoming a blemish on America's leadership in countering the crime of sex trafficking in the, in the world. The TVPA is due for reauthorization this year, and we have an opportunity to restore its promise to protections for victims. Just as online businesses have expanded exponentially in the years since the CDA was enacted, human trafficking, including sex trafficking of children, has also become one of the fastest growing crimes in the United States. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported that over the last five years, it has seen a 98% increase in reports of suspected child sex trafficking, much of this occurring online. Sex trafficking has moved to the internet, so let's accept that. Shared Hope has been working for several years to ensure there's both civil and criminal liability for those who facilitate sex trafficking on the internet. Most recently, we submitted an amicus brief with allied organizations in support of those, in support of, of the plaintiff's writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court that case is called Jane Doe 1, 2, and 3 versus Backpage.com. In this case, three child sex trafficking victims were sold for sex on Backpage.com, and they were seeking civil liability for their injuries. They alleged that the company knowingly facilitated and profited from their exploitation. Their claims were denied by the Federal District Court on the grounds that Backpage.com is immune of civil liability under the CDA. We joined Koamichi to argue for a common sense interpretation of the CDA that does not allow online classified companies to facilitate criminal activity with impunity. When the Supreme Court denied the petition, congressional clarification became the essential next step to clarify that trafficking victims must not be denied the protections provided under the TVPA just because they are being exploited on the internet. When the CDA was enacted in 1996, legislators put legal protections in place for internet-based businesses seeking to strike a balance between an open and vibrant internet with the risk that this platform could also be abused for criminal purposes. This is section 230 of the CDA. It provides immunity from all civil liability and from state criminal liability. Federal criminal liability was retained in order to balance the protections for businesses with enforcement of criminal laws. However, the multi-million dollar marketplace for sex trafficking victims that exists online today could not have been contemplated when this balance was struck in 1996. Indeed, sex trafficking of children at that time was largely perceived as a crime that was happening overseas, mm -hmm. or it just wasn't known. Mm -hmm. Today, through the leadership of survivor advocates, we have a much better insight into the world of sex trafficking and the role that the internet plays. But access to justice for these victims is being stopped by the immunity provisions in Section 230. Backpage.com is the target currently. 
due to its size and its impressive fight against the liability for victimization of minors on its site or the accountability for its business practices. The Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations completed an extensive investigation into the conduct and practices of Backpage.com recently. It led to some very damning evidence against them. But Backpage.com is not likely to be the only entity to exploit the protections of Section 230 in order to profit from this online marketplace for sex trafficking victims. The profits will continue to lure new bad actors into this space as long as they enjoy the broad protections provided under the CDA. Internet companies that are not in the business of profiting from the exploitation of sex trafficking victims are, of course, concerned about any legislation impacting current protections. For this reason, a strategic approach is necessary to amend the current immunity, the strategic approach is critical to avoid putting good actors in the technology industry in the untenable position of advocating for the status quo, even when the status quo is leading to gross human rights violations. In addition, a comprehensive approach is essential. To be comprehensive, any CDA, CDA amendment must be inclusive of adult sex trafficking. Yes. Extending protections to adult victims ensures that protections for child sex trafficking victims also are not undermined by claims of perceived age or consent, as well as protecting adults who are initially exploited as children and remain in their trafficking situations as adults. Three problems persist within the CDA. First, the section grants civil immunity to interactive computer service providers, defined broadly to include many online businesses. Second, the section establishes federal preemption for any state prosecution of ICSPs. And third, the mens rea required to establish intent under the federal criminal law, 18 U.S.C. 1591, is set at a level that is unrealizable to prove a criminal case against an online bad actor whose passively culpable role in facilitating that child sex trafficking or adult sex trafficking does not clearly fall within the parameters of the existing law. Civil lawsuits have worked their, their way through the courts, particularly against Backpage.com. And um, new suits have recently been filed in Florida and Arizona based on evidence that Backpage.com actively participated in preparing the content for advertisements. But this is not limited to Backpage.com, as I said. And an action against one very bad actor will not stop the crime from flourishing. Uh, existing and future bad actors will they'll recognize the profit to be made in this lawless landscape. Federal prosecution preemption, um, various efforts have been made with respect to um, restoring the state's abilities to prosecute. Um, most notably, uh, the, the National Association of Attorneys General submitted a letter signed by 47 state attorneys general in 2013. They offered a surgical fix to the language of Section 230 that would return the authority to the jurisdictions to investigate and prosecute the crimes occurring in their state to no end. Activating the state prosecutors could lead to increased law enforcement in this area and protect far more victims from sex trafficking occurring online. To date, the U.S. Department of Justice has not brought a criminal action for sex trafficking against an online entity advertising commercial sex. There could be many reasons for this. One of them is the mens rea proof barrier. In summary, the four essential objectives of a CDA amendment are, number one, lift the civil immunity in cases of sex trafficking to allow victims to sue offending internet businesses. Number two, eliminate the federal preemption for criminal prosecutions of sex trafficking to allow state prosecutors to enforce their state laws. And number three, 
lower the mens rea for ICSPs under 1591. And lastly, number four, include all sex trafficking, not just child sex trafficking. The bright line of 18 years old does not remove the control a sex trafficking victim is under. Let's restore our TVPA to the shining example that it was when it passed in 2000 and has been in around the world since then. Let's not let the CBA stay in conflict with the protections provided under that law. Thank you. And now for our final speaker, it is impossible to adequately address every issue of sexual exploitation in one afternoon, although we've given it a fair shot. But we would be remiss if we did not address the concern around our nation of campus sexual assault. And that is what Dr. Marie Irvine will be speaking to today. She is an anthropologist whose research focuses on rape culture and sexual violence in the United States. And in her role as the director of campus initiatives for the Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault, Dr. Irvine is responsible for envisioning, developing, and managing Indiana's statewide campus consortium and ensuring its success. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be taking part in this event today. I appreciate the leadership that the National Center on Sexual Exploitation continues to show as they lead the fight against sexual violence in our country. Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972 protects people from discrimination on the basis of sex in any federally funded education program or activity. Over the past six years, our country's leaders and citizens have engaged in very complex conversations about how Title IX should be used as a guiding principle to ensure that students of all genders are safe and free from discrimination, including sexual assault. This call for educators to examine their sexual violence prevention and response efforts has been a call toward equity in our schools. All schools, post-secondary institutions, as well as elementary, middle, and high schools should continue to respond to reports of sexual assault. We see many aspects of sex discrimination in our schools every day, including verbal harassment, bullying, stalking, social media exploitation, dating violence, and sexual violence. Sexual violence is a significant form of sex discrimination, and millions of students in our schools, especially girls, women, and LGBTQ individuals endure ongoing sex discrimination, including sexual assaults. Some critics of Title IX argue that schools should not even conduct investigations related to violent crimes like rape. At first, this argument may seem valid. Certainly, colleges and universities are not law enforcement agencies. But the simple reality is that campus investigations are not criminal investigations. School administrators conduct investigations to determine whether someone's civil rights, as guaranteed under Title IX, have been violated. When students turn to their campus administrators for help, they understand that they're not seeking help from the police. College students value the options afforded to them by Title IX because often they do not even want criminal investigations. Title IX protects access to education. When sex discrimination, including assault, rises to a level of creating a hostile environment so that students' academic experiences are negatively impacted, we can turn to Title IX and use it as a remedy to address that hostile environment. If campus administrators are no longer allowed to conduct investigations, they will lose the opportunity to remedy the problem of hostile environments in their schools. Additionally, the vast majority of sexual assault reports made to campus administrators would not result in criminal investigations because prosecutors have discretion about which cases to pursue, and they usually do not move forward with campus cases. Furthermore, campuses must conduct their investigations within a window of 60 calendar days. However, criminal investigations and court proceedings can take several years. Therefore, it's extremely misleading for critics to claim that criminal investigations result in better justice for students, because usually those students will never see their cases make it to the courtroom, or they must wait years before their cases are resolved. I have worked with and trained many campus officials, and they are keenly aware of how their roles differ from law enforcement officers and prosecutors. 
Many campus administrators are extremely well qualified to conduct student conduct code violations and HR investigations. Professional organizations, including the Association for Title IX Administrators, ATICSA, provide rigorous trainings to campus professionals on topics like fair adjudication processes, trauma-informed investigations, and compliance with laws and regulations. Many other campus administrators bring in highly qualified consultants to review and revise policies and procedures. Therefore, the claim that campus administrators are not qualified to conduct investigations is deeply flawed. As long as these campus administrators have been well trained, they are likely to be the most highly qualified people in our nation to conduct student conduct codes and human resource investigations. Other critics want schools to use the beyond a reasonable doubt standard in investigations, which is a higher burden of proof than the preponderance of evidence standard. However, the preponderance of evidence standard is the best choice for campus investigations. This standard requires the investigator or the adjudicating body to consider what was more likely than not to have occurred based on the information gathered in the investigation. If the burden of proof were any higher than more likely than not, it would require that reported victims prove to a greater extent than the accused students that the victims were harmed. In other words, the beyond a reasonable doubt burden, our standard would place more burden upon the victim, and this in itself would be an act of inequity. It's also important to note that campus investigations are based on civil, not criminal law. Even in the courts, civil cases are subject to the preponderance standard. If campuses were conducting criminal investigations, then it would be very important for us to use beyond a reasonable doubt, because the criminal punishment for rape is usually incarceration. Ideally, anyway. However, students who are found responsible of violating conduct codes are not incarcerated. The most significant outcome for students who are found responsible of sexual misconduct is expulsion. And this is a statement from universities to the students that, in essence, says, you acted in such a way that you did not uphold the values of our institution, and as a result, you are no longer allowed to attend here. Colleges and universities already report a wide variety of crimes to campus law enforcement through their compliance with the Clery Act. However, over the past few years, policymakers in several states have proposed legislation that would require post-secondary schools to report information about sexual assaults to local law enforcement. Some of these proposed bills simply require campuses to notify law enforcement about a sexual assault. But others try to require schools to provide personally identifying information about the cases. Fortunately, most of these proposed bills have not passed, although a bill did just pass in Georgia, and Virginia has recent new laws about mandatory police reporting. I want to explain why sharing information with law enforcement against the wishes of adult survivors is such a terrible idea. This type of policy could result in serious harm and re-victimization to survivors. Many adult survivors fear that if they report sexual assaults to police, they will be blamed for the attacks, or that perpetrators will retaliate against them. Survivors who are people of color, LGBTQ, or who belong to minority religious groups may have additional concerns about engaging with police. Rape and other forms of sexual violence are events in which victims experience a profound loss of control over their bodies and their lives. We should always provide victims with options so they feel empowered and they are in control. It's extremely important for survivors to be offered choices and for us as a society to respect their choices even if their decisions don't match up with our own personal sentiments regarding justice. Mm -hmm. A society that forces survivors to report to police is a society that re-victimizes survivors, taking power away from them and disrespecting their wishes. Mandatory law enforcement reporting could result in a profoundly chilling effect on campus reporting. Many victimized students would stay silent about their experiences because they would not want their information shared with the police. Mandatory police reporting would make campuses far less safe because serial offenders would be able to operate with impunity knowing their victims would no longer come forward to make campus reports. As for prevention, it is extremely important for our schools to use evidence-based approaches. Many campuses right now are able to comply with Title IX and VAWA without actually using research-based prevention efforts. 
For example, multiple research studies have demonstrated that rape is not caused by miscommunication. Yet many schools merely check the box when it comes to educating students about consent. There are many excellent research studies that provide us with information about the root causes of sexual violence, characteristics and behaviors of perpetrators, and evidence-based models for violence prevention programs. It's also extremely important for our schools to focus on macro-level ways to create safe campuses. Recently, our country's new political administration rescinded Title IX guidance, instructing schools to allow trans students to use the bathrooms of the genders with which they identify. The rescinding of this guidance sends a dangerous message, a message that trans people do not deserve respect and protection when it comes to their very basic human needs to use the restroom. Forcing trans people to use bathrooms that do not match their gender identities will put them at a higher risk for harassment, physical assault, and sexual violence. Opponents of trans rights erroneously argue that allowing trans women to use women's bathrooms will make it easier for these trans women to sexually assault women and girls. This claim has no basis in reality, and it perpetuates a hateful myth that trans people are sexual predators. In fact, the opposite of this myth is true. In our nation, LGBTQ people are at extremely high risks of sexual victimization. Trans students on our campuses are assaulted and harassed, and we must protect them. I recommend viewing the recent position statement released by CAPA to learn about best practices for protecting trans students. If we, as a nation, believe in the inherent worth and value of all our citizens, why have we rescinded Title IX guidance that sought to protect our trans students? As a nation, we can do better, and we must do better if we want to ensure that all of our students of all genders are safe and protected. Finally, it's important for policymakers and college administrators to recognize how sexual violence connects with other aspects of students' lives, including students' consumption of pornography. Pornography is directly related to sexual violence. Our educational system should prepare students of all ages to think critically and logically, to be able to differentiate fact from fiction, and to be able to recognize when people are manipulating and controlling them through media, like pornography. The incorporation of mandatory critical media literacy programs into schools could be an effective strategy in our fight against sexual violence. Our country is saturated with harmful messages about sexual violence, and yet our students continue to graduate from college without taking classes that teach them how to critically analyze and challenges the messages they receive from media sources. If we want the United States to remain a strong and powerful leader in the world, we must insist that our students become well-trained in identifying, analyzing, and challenging media that tries to manipulate and control them. The inclusion of critical media literacy curriculum requirements is an excellent way to strengthen Title IX guidance, make our campuses safer, and make our students more effective, thoughtful, and rational leaders and citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. That now concludes this panel, and we can open up the floor again for a few questions. We've got one down here. Yeah, could you expand more on what has happened in the countries that already have legalized um, or fully decriminalized prostitution? Um, so when we worked, just, just to give you a little historical background, it was after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, the collapse of the Soviet Union that all of a sudden European countries saw this massive uh, influx of, of exploited women. Samantha and I were talking about that since she was in Moldova. So, uh, so in the late 1990s and early 2000s is when there was this flurry of legislation, both internationally and nationally, on how to address sex trafficking and prostitution. So European countries went two ways. So you had the Netherlands that decided 
we needed to protect these uh, these women. So let's legalize it so that, um, as I mentioned, so that women can register <clears throat> with the government, and if there are any <clears throat> abuse, if there's any abuse within brothels, they can get um, help and 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 justice recourse, etc. Um, what has happened, well, all that to say is that at the time when we were fighting for the Nordic model um, and, and really trying to get a comprehensive definition of the plan or protocol, our opponents were calling for legalization. And now we have uh, Germany, um, the Netherlands, certain states of Australia, where it's, a, it's an open market. It's a green light, right? So it's because it's, it's supply and demand, if you green light not only sex buying, but also pimps and traffickers, you have a situation where traffickers are migrant facilitators and pimps are businessmen. And uh, even if local police, which is what we're seeing in, in Rotterdam, Amsterdam, in, across Germany, is that even if the police is seeing organized crime, a lot of violence, a lot of suffering, they can't go in to such establishment because it is a legal establishment and you need to find probable cause and the, the systems, the jurisdictional systems are very complicated to get those warrants for wiretapping, etc. So, so right now, I mean, if you just go online and you look on uh, about legalization in, uh, in Germany, what we're seeing is, as I mentioned, just countrywide brothels where, and I'll tell you some of the the menus, uh, the menu items on on um, for these brothels. So you can order uh, blood sports, which involves cutting and and getting blood from the woman. They have multi-storied uh, brothels where you have the gang rape floor, where you and your buddies can come on a Friday night for sixty-nine euros for bratwurst, beer, and all the sex you can get, and gang rape women. You have nudist floors where all women wear our stiletto heels, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it has created a market for exploitation that is accepted. Um, and then it trickles down into society where sex buying is as natural as going to buy a donut at the local station. So now, then, and I'm, I know I'm, I'm, I'm extending the, the answer, but but now that, that there, there is evidence about the disasters of legalization, our opponents are now calling for decriminalization, which is what is happening in New Zealand. And, but it's really, it's, it's the same except that decriminalization, there's absolutely no regulation whatsoever. And so it's very hard to know what is actually happening, but the survivors are coming out of New Zealand, so. My question is for Dr. Irvine. I appreciate the best practices because that, that's where we want to look at where it's working. Uh, my question to you is, there was an original list of 100, now it's almost 200 of schools that continue to find themselves on the wrong side of this topic of DOJ. What is the pushback? Is it that there's still a blind eye? Is it the top down that's not willing to make the changes? Why are we still seeing names? Of camp campuses added to this list. Sure, that's that's a great question. Um, so a lot of this just has to do even with the time frame. So these might be cases where students, you know, reported to their schools years ago, and then you know more recently learned that they could go to OCR and make a complaint and have the campus be investigated. So um, yeah, the the list of schools has blown up dramatically. Um, and what I would always say is that's a great thing because that means students are actually aware of their rights as students. Um, so, so it's not necessarily, I mean, we certainly do still have schools that aren't doing a great job with investigations or adjudications and things like that. But I think that this ever-growing list, that these could be students who maybe very recently they feel like their school didn't handle their situation well, but it could also be from years back that they're now coming forward. Well, thank you so much for all attending this event. This is a presentation of the Freedom from Sexploitation Agenda, which is something that some different policy points were highlighted during this event.
but please make sure to take our freedom agenda, which has 16 specific policy recommendations that can be done to combat the full spectrum or large portion of the spectrum of sexual exploitation in American policy today. You can learn more at nsexualexploitation.org. At freedom at sexploitationfreedomagenda.com. These presentations will be made available along with the written publication of these presentations. Thank you all for coming here for advocating for human rights to be free from sexual exploitation, objectification, and violence. I hope you all have a great day.